Okay, we're going to call the meeting to order, please. Vice Mayor Cruz? Here. Council Member Hewer? Here. Council Member Campion? Here. Council Member Lampson? Here. Mayor Powers? Here. I forgot to say, Kimberly, anything <laughs> you have to say about the closed session? Uh, there is no reportable action. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry. Uh, must be a little hot or something. Um, okay, um, I'm going to have a minute of silent prayer and then the flag salute. Also, would you read the code? Would you do the flag for when it's time, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Ms. Donna, the video statement, please. This meeting of the Galt City Council will be cablecast on Metro Cable 14, the local government affairs channel, on the Comcast Consolidated Communications, and AT&T U-verse cable systems. The meeting is closed captioned and website at w webcast at www.sacsmetrocable.tv. Today's meeting will air Friday, June 23rd, and Saturday, June 24th at 9 a.m. The City Council meeting videos are also archived on the City's website and a DVD copy is available for checkout from any library branch. Thank you. Council, is there any agenda approval, additions, and or deletions? Yes. I know you have one, City Clerk. Could you please mm -hmm. read it for us? Yes. I request to move the uh, recommended budget to after the consent calendar and also the master fee schedule to uh, under scheduled matters after the capital improvement program. Okay, Council. You okay with that? Okay. On to presentations. First of all, we'd like to introduce our new employee, Chris O'Connell from the Wastewater Department. Well, unfortunately, uh, okay. he, well, fortunately, he couldn't be here tonight. Fortunately, in that he's actually attending night school working on his. Uh, his associate in arts degree at Toronto Community College and is uh, something we encourage our employees to do is further their education and he wanted to be here but he said I can't be both places and said I would introduce him briefly. He's a new wastewater operator, uh, is an operator in training, has his initial entry level uh, wastewater and water treatment certifications. So we're very thrilled to have him on board and uh, hopefully we'll get a face in front of you in a, in a future meeting. Okay. Now at the Real Life Church, your community benefit grant report to the City Council. Good evening, Council. Um, my name is Michelle Bustamante and I'm with um, Real Life After School Program. And I'm here to give a report on how we spent um, the Galt Community Grant that we received last year. So, um, we would like to thank you so much for your continued support for our after school program. This year we were able to take the thousand dollar funds and put them directly back into our program and expand some areas of our program that were really needed. Um, one of them was our music program. Um, this year we were able to buy nine portable roll up pianos and a class set of recorders for our, um, for our students that take our music program. So, it's really hard to teach a large group of children music if you don't have portable equipment. So um, we bought nine of those pianos and it allowed us to offer uh, the music program to more of those students. So, um, with most of our children coming to our program needing access to um, Google accounts and online homework access, we were able to buy a new laptop to um, give them um, access to internet and stuff to do the reports on, Microsoft Word, Google Docs, PowerPoint, and that kind of thing. Um, we were also able to expand our recreation room. We bought a brand new ping pong table, which the children really enjoyed. Um, we were able to buy some new sports equipment like pool sticks, and we also purchased a new um, outdoor tennis set. So it's a collapsible tennis that you put outside, and then you take it down and bring it in when the day is over. So that's really fun for them. Um, kind of broke up 
some other day. Um, we were also able to rent a couple um, different bounce houses, one of them on the very last day of program, a gigantic 20-foot water slide, and we had a very fun um, water day. So um, we really appreciate your guys' continued support. It is our, um, at the core of our program that we're a resource center for families, and your guys' grant is, um, continues to allow us to do that. I wish I had um, all night to share with you some of the personal stories of children that have come through our program. We have children um, that come to our program that are homeless in our community, and so our program provides them a place where, of stability where they can come and get support and counseling and food. And we have children that come who tell me, Miss Michelle, I don't have any food at my house tonight for dinner. And so our program's connected to our food pantry, and we're able to really just be a resource for families overall as a whole. So. Um, our kids come and they have a lot of um, fun and when you look at our numbers on the paper um, you can see that but really um, thank you so much for your continued support that allows us to continue to be a, a real resource to um, kids in our community that otherwise don't have um, this opportunity so I appreciate um, your guys' time and if I can answer any questions um, I would love to do that for you. Council? Well, we want to also thank you for all you do for the community. You're a great uh, benefit to us, and uh, we do want to thank you for everything you do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, the Galt Youth Commission, student member appointments and administering the oath of office. Donna, that's to you. Okay, so this is a, a two-part action. Um, recommended action is to accept the student member appointment selected by the Galt Youth Commission adult mentors. And once City Council accepts those six new members, um, I'll come down and we'll swear them in. Per the Galt Municipal Code section 2.85.050, the student members shall be interviewed by the adult members of the commission. Each student member shall be submitted for acceptance by the City Council and shall serve a two-year term commencing on June 1st and ending on May 31st. The, um, they have 30 applications and they interviewed uh, 16 students and the applications are all attached um, to the agenda report. Any questions? Any questions, Council? Mm -hmm. Okay, you're going to entertain motion. Oh, uh, do I have a motion to uh, approve the appointments? So moved. Second. Okay, uh, second. Okay, uh, Mark and Paige, whichever way you want to do it. Um, call for the vote, please. Vice Mayor Cruz? Aye. Council Member Hewer? Aye. Council Member Campion? Aye. Council Member Lamson? Aye. Mayor Powers? Aye. Uh, pass five to zero. Okay. Um, Mr. Gordon, could I have you come to the microphone and call the new six members up? That way I can be sure that their names are pronounced correctly. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, so we have six. We have Acelio Gonzalez. We have Christian Gonzalez. Come on up, guys. We have um, Daniel Treviso, we have Miracle Franco, and we also have um, two members that are coming back and serving a second term, Juliet Rodriguez and Amanda Yebra. <laughs> I'm Celia Gonzalez. I Christian Gonzalez. <laughs> One, two. I Daniel Treviso. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California against all enemies foreign and domestic. I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States 
Constitution to the state of California. That I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or a purpose of evasion and during such time as I am a student member of the God Youth Commission. I will faithfully discharge the duties of commission member according to the best of my ability. Okay, and now we have the Gulf Youth Commission Annual Report for the City Council. Hi, and thank you for allowing us to speak today. Um, my name is Juliette. And I'm Olivia. And we are here to present you with the Galt Youth Commission's Annual Report. So this year, I was the chair, and Olivia was our vice chair, and Martina Mueller was the secretary, Alex Gamas was our treasurer, Jesus Cuevas was publicity chair, and Paige Sessions was our fundraising chair. The other commissioners this past year were Amanda Yebra, Kirsten Miller, Hannah Hassey, and Magali Muniz. The purpose of the Galt Youth Commission is to inform the city council of youth needs, encourage the youth to be more involved in the community, and create unity in our town by working together with youth and community leaders. This year, the Youth Commission gave a huge focus to creating a strong and connected team through different team building activities. As a team, we had our annual ice cream social at the start of the year in order to learn about the standards and future events of the Commission, as well as getting to know each other. From experience, I can say that the team building has helped me feel closer to my fellow commissioners, rather than feeling like there is a division between new and old members. Throughout the year, we also bonded through a, <laughs> through a team building session at Cal Waste, a drum, a drum circle at, and campfire at McFarland Ranch, a canoe trip at the Consumnist River Preserve, uh, and a day at the in chambered escape room at, at, in Sacramento. This year, the Galt Youth Commission was fortunate enough to participate in a team building session at Cal Waste, where we did activities to build trust, learn about each other, and learn about strength. Then we went on a canoe trip at the Consumnist River Preserve to learn the importance of teamwork in small groups. To help commissioners bond with each other and with the adult mentors, we also went to McFarland Ranch for a team building drum circle and campfire. Each person chose their own drum and we sat together and explored how everyone has their own sound and made music together. A very important part of the Galt Youth Commission is community service and giving back. As we have in past years, we continue to serve through our annual commitments at the Extravaganza, Strawberry Festival, Cracking with Santa, the Winter Bird Festival, the John Moran Scholarship, and more. However, we also explored the wants and needs of the youth and were able to brainstorm for new projects. For example, we had the Teen Lifestyle articles in the Galt Herald to share the youth opinions with the community through writing. We also continued with the Teen Perspective Art Exhibit and had a new presence at the Tiny Smiles 5K. This year, the Galt Youth Commission held an annual pancake breakfast at the Extravaganza with the help of the Galt Lions and as well as volunteers from both the Commission and the Rotary Club. All of the money raised went towards the John Moran Scholarship. We were able to award three scholarships this year, each of $500, to three outstanding seniors and hope to continue this tradition in the future. As a part of our commitment to serve the youth, we decided to branch out and try a new project. We formed a subcommittee 
dedicated to informing youth about the importance of a healthy lifestyle of exercise and nutrition. The subcommittee decided to take part in the Tiny Smiles Run by leading kids in proper stretches before the race, serving healthy smoothies for the runners to enjoy after the race, and having a booth with healthy tips and information for the community. Also this year, the Youth Commission continued with the Team Perspective Code exhibit after its successful impact last year. This year's event's theme was changed to how I affect the world to help the community better understand how youth felt they impacted those around them. We also asked the community to nominate 10 youth who had done amazing things for their community, family, or friends, but had not been recognized for these um, outstanding acts. We were able to honor these 10 youth at the art exhibit, as well as present one outstanding youth with a $100 award from the Galt Rotary Club. One important thing that I learned from planning this event is the important of, importance of sponsorship, um, as well as seeking help for our event. Our event would not have been possible if we hadn't seeked help and sponsorship from Don Atoli or seeked um, sponsorship from grants such as the Gabby Grant. One important skill that the Galt Youth Commission values highly is learning to speak for the youth and give presentations. This year, commissioners were able to practice speaking skills and engagement skills by speaking to the City Council, the Galt Lions Club, and the Galt Sunrise Rotary. Also, the youth were able to, oh, also by representing the Galt Youth Commission at the Delta College Education Forum and speaking on behalf of the youth through the Galt Herald um, Teen Lifestyle articles. These editorials were discussed and written by the Youth Commission's editorial board and published on its own page in the Galt Herald. Throughout the year, we had multiple editorials published every month voicing the topics of interest to the youth in our community. Several focuses of the commission this year were public speaking, event planning, collaboration and partnerships, and governance. To help grow our speaking skills, the Galt Youth Commission included monthly lessons on leadership during our meetings. Also, our subcommittees for things such as Crafting with Santa, the Pancake Breakfast, the Tiny Smiles Run, and the Teen Perspective Art Exhibit helped us develop organization and planning skills. To help us build partnerships, the Galt Youth Commission helped with events held by the Library, the Galt Sunrise Rotary, the Galt City Council, the Galt Lions Club, and more. Many of our fundraisers for our events would not have been possible without the help of these organizations. We were also able to learn about governance from watching city council meetings and connecting with community leaders in order to learn more about how local government works. For example, we worked together with the city's economic development manager in order to learn more about economic development in Galt, as well as producing a survey for high school students in order to obtain feedback on what the youth would like to see in our town. We received over 1,100 survey responses and are still working to organize the data. On behalf of the Galt Youth Commission, we would like to thank you, the City Council, for your support, as well as our previous City Council representative, Barbara Payne, and our adult mentors throughout the past year, Lupe Flores, Tracy Cross, John Gordon, Lisa Klotz, America Valesco, and Paige Lamson for all of their support. Um, we also want to say a sincere goodbye to our graduating commissioner, Hannah Hassey, who has served on the Youth Commission for four years, a dedicated total of two years or two year, two terms, yeah, <laughs> two two year terms. Um, our other outgoing commissioners include Alice Gamez and Kirsten Miller, who each dedicated two years to the commission. We would also like to say thank you to Tracy Cross and Paige Lampson for joining our youth commission family as committed mentors, as well as a huge welcome and congratulations to our new, com new commissioners, Christian Gonzalez, Celio Gonzalez, Daniel Treviso, Miracle Franco, and our returning members, Juliet Rodriguez and Amanda Yebra. Thank you for allowing us to speak today. May we answer any questions? Questions, Council? Very good. No, well, you do a fantastic job, and thank you so much for all the things you do in our community. You're the leaders of tomorrow, and we're very proud of you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, public comment please, Donna. Under Government Code Section 54954.3, members of the public may address the Council on non-agenda items. Speakers, shall, speakers may address Council on any agenda item during consideration of the item.
speakers shall restrict their comments to issues that are within the subject matter jurisdiction of the City Council and limit comments to a maximum of five minutes. Please fill out a speaker sheet located on the table inside the entrances to the Council Chambers and forward the completed speaker sheet to the clerk. And I have one speaker. Thank you, Bonnie Rodriguez. Good evening, Madam Mayor and Council Members. I'm actually here. We're a little late. Uh, with presenting this. I'm here to present um, a check actually to Chief Sockman. Uh, as you know, Chief Sockman and two other gentlemen uh, competed in our Battle of the Chefs for the Strawberry Festival. And he uh, competed against them. I think this is kind of, uh, kind of neat today because we actually have more people here today that were involved with the Strawberry Festival. Um, Rich Lozano who competed as a, as a chef as well on behalf of the CSD is here for some reason and our MC is here and of course uh, Vice Mayor was one of our judges so we actually have a lot of people here to, to witness this. But as you know he competed in three rounds of very cool weather um, around <laughs> all that, the fires and everything that were going on in there and um, unfortunately did not come in first but that's okay because he was, he was uh, very fun in the kitchen and uh, after being teased by the firefighters for eating donuts and then even had a <laughs> spontaneous donut eating contest which he won by the way. So I don't know <laughs> what he was trying to prove there but <laughs> um, but it was very fun and we were very grateful that the that the chief and the city was behind the strawberry festival and the entertainment and, and it was very fun so I'd like to present this check. Um, he was representing End of Watch and so we have a check for End of Watch for you. I, I promise you I was not, I was going to come in third. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Okay, uh, Donna, would you please read the information and consent calendar? Uh -huh. Item number one, minutes of the regular meeting of June 6, 2017. Item two is receive and file warrants for the period ending June 6, 2017. Item three, intent to renew Galt's cooperation agreement with the Sacramento Housing and Redevelopment Agency for administration of the city's community development block grant activities. Item four is ward of landscape contract. Item five, appropriations limit for fiscal year 2017-2018. Item 6, adopt a resolution authorizing the city manager to execute a master services agreement with Vision Technology Solutions Incorporated for upgrade of the city's website design hosting and content management. Item 7 is supplemental appropriation for the purchase of properties to accommodate the future Walnut Avenue interchange at Highway 99. Item 8, employer paid member contributions to the California Public Employees Retirement System. Item 9, Galt Landscaping and Lighting District Engineer's Report. Intention to levy and collect assessments for fiscal year 2017-2018 and set public hearings. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve, please? So moved. Second? Second. Council Member Campion and Count, uh, Vice Mayor Cruz, call for the vote, please. Vice Mayor Cruz? Aye. Council Member Hewer? Aye. Council Member Campion? Aye. Council Member Lamson? Aye. Mayor Powers? Aye. Pass five to zero. Okay, so now we're we're going to uh, number four and taking it up here to number one? Correct. Okay, so that is the recommended 2016-17 and 2017-18 budget adjustment. Emily, that's to you. Good evening, Mayor Powers and members of the Council. I'm Emily Boyd, Finance Director for the City. Um, before I begin the PowerPoint and talk about that, I just want to say how proud and grateful I am to have superstars in the Finance Department team. They're sitting back there. We have Michelle Neely, who next January, I believe, will be, have been an employee of the City for 20 years. She does a bang-up job for us on the budget. She kind of manages the budget documents, the budget um, Excel files, the adaptive budget program, and she manages all of that very well for us. And her knowledge of the city is very helpful. 
Uh, we have Matt Boring, who is our financial analyst. He's been with the city four or five years, I think, now, and he is a genius when it comes to Excel spreadsheets, and we're really grateful for his analytical abilities. And we also have Vera Wittenberg, who is new. Um, you guys met her a few months ago. We're very glad that she's on our team as well. She is responsible for preparing the CIP budget in the presentation tonight. Um, and it wouldn't be fair if I didn't give a shout out to Kathy Burris, our administrative assistant, who you know, she does a real good job for us in getting all these documents, the binders that you got on the, the, uh, the uh, budget documents in your binders as well. So thank you guys. So that binder that you got and the budget document that's in the uh, agenda packet on the website is 262 pages long. Now I don't really expect everyone to read every page, but if you did, great. Um, there's two things that I would recommend, um, not just to the council and to, to city staff, but also to the public, um, that are documents that would be really helpful if, if you had an opportunity to read them. Uh, the first is the city manager's letter of transmittal for the operating budget, and the second is the city manager's uh, letter of transmittal for the CIP budget. Both of those letters will give you a real good overview of the financial condition of the city, the changes that we are proposing in the budget, the capital improvement projects that are going on, and so it's a real, I think it's, those two documents are very beneficial. So, whew, that green introduction doesn't show up very well, does it? I'll have to use a different color next time. So we have a lot of positives going on with the city of Galt right now. Uh, we have a, a good economic outlook. Um, we have increased retail and housing development. Um, our property sales and TOT taxes are um, up. You'll see some graphs on those a little bit later in this presentation. Um, we are working on a strategic financial plan. Um, I'm hoping that next year at this time we'll be talking about, or maybe even before next year at this time, we're going to be talking about a five-year financial plan so we can do some long-term financial planning. Uh, but we also have challenges, and the challenges are, uh, they're there, and, and they can seem big and insurmountable, but I think that we can together figure out a way to get through these. One is that the personal costs from CalPERS keep going up, and right now, the main thing that has happened is CalPERS reduced their discount rate. Um, the discount rate is how much they anticipate to earn on their investments, and therefore they discount how much you have to pay into the program. And so they've reduced that rate. It has had the effect of increasing, uh, we have estimated projections for the city, and over five years it will increase our miscellaneous plan obligation by about um, 1.2 or 1.3 million. And the public service um, or safety plan will also be around a million dollars over five years. That is more than what we would have paid if the discount rate hadn't been lowered. Um, we have a compensation study that's out there that we need to address. Um, there's a minimum wage increase coming. Um, and so the employees that we have that are on minimum wage, they will be receiving increases in pay. And that sometimes causes compaction issues where other people now they're making the same amount when really there should be some, some um, space between them. And we have deferred maintenance. And we've been talking about that for a year on uh, buildings and vehicles and um, IT infrastructure. Um, so what, what is, these are the structural changes that we made to the budget this year. And the big one is the cost allocation. And I talked to you about that in May. Um, what the changes we made to cost allocation. We, alt we changed our methodology um, to a more um, objective rather than a subjective me methodology. Uh, we've made it uh, what we believe is very transparent. Um, if anybody has questions about it, please feel free to ask. Um, and we also, what we also did is we took anything that we could directly charge, uh, we directly charged rather than putting it through the allocation process. So, for example, utility billing and collections. We know that the staff that does the utility billing and collections spend roughly 80% of their time on utilities and 20% of their time on other city business. And so we took 80% of the personnel costs and distributed it to the utility funds rather than having that money get distributed through cost allocation where it would hit not just the utility funds, but it would hit Parks and Rec and everybody else. 
So we think that's a more effective way to manage it. We also took Public Works Administration costs uh, for personnel and moved those to the utility funds or the other special revenue funds where we know that those personnel are working. And we also uh, direct, started directly charging parks to, to where they should be, um, whether it was the Parks and Rec Fund or the General Fund or the l and Fund. Um, <clears throat> the library revenue and expense, we took that out of the Parks and Recreation Fund and put it into General Fund. And the reason for that is the, the main activity with the library right now is the annual maintenance on the building and then there's a CIP project for a library expansion. Both of those items are managed out of the Public Works Department and Public Works Department administration is out of the general fund and Parks and Rec really ha doesn't have that hands-on involvement with it anymore so we felt it was more appropriate to be in the general fund. Um, we also added a special benefits division we call it special benefits or events or something. We started, we set up a division in the general fund for for those activities so that we could specifically track what those costs are. Hard and soft costs will be specifically tracked so we, we can be able to report to you on those. And then on the firing range, I think it was at the last meeting or maybe it was the meeting before when the council voted to set up an enterprise fund for the firing range. And how that's going to work is that the revenue that we get in for rents of the firing range will be used to pay for the maintenance of the firing range. Um, we are proposing some minor improvements and um, the balance of the revenue left over will be used to repay that interfund loan that uh, we borrowed the money to build the, the long range out there a year or two back. Personnel changes. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Now, if you want to look at this in detail or see the description on it, it's on page 12 uh, of the binder or page 7 of the city manager uh, operating budget transmittal letter. But I will just cover them briefly. The community development department has a situation where they've been trying to hire a senior planner and haven't been able to find a qualified applicant. And so in order to get them organized over there and get them the staffing that they need, we made two proposed changes. The administrative assistant uh, is going to be an assistant planner and the senior planner will be an assistant planner. And when you look at the dollars there, when you make those changes in personnel costs, we're actually saving, I think it was around 30000 It's It's in the budget memo. Mm -hmm. um, Public Works Department, the Public Works Maintenance Supervisor, I believe, I hope I got this the right way, not backwards, uh, is renamed to a Streets Maintenance Supervisor, and the vacant office assistant through three is changed to an administrative assistant. In Parks and Rec, we're proposing a new position of a sports events tournament coordinator. That is so we can take advantage of what the city has here in, in the parks and recreation facilities that we have. And we found in, in recent, and I reported this to you last year during the budget, and we've been talking about this a lot in recent months, is that what we have found is that when we have sporting events in town, the hotels fill up and the restaurants are seeing an increase in their business. Um, so both of those activities bring the city increased TOT and increased sales tax through the, uh, through the restaurant sales. Um, and then also the parks maintenance work for one. What I left off of here, which I realized this afternoon, was in the administration department, a slight shift there where um, we're going to have two support staff, uh, the position that um, uh, Jennifer used to have as an executive assistant and then also an administrative assistant and those two support staff will support the city, uh, the city council, the city clerk, the city attorney, who am I missing? City manager. <laughs> uh, sorry, Jane. <laughs> All right, boy, this is really rough. Sorry, you guys. I can read some of those numbers to you maybe. Property tax, this is where does the money come from and it's schedule one on page 23 of your binders. Um, and that schedule doesn't have the pie chart, it has the numbers. So where does our money come from? 46% of our general fund revenue comes from property taxes. 27% um, that next big piece of the pie is, I'm sorry, 23% is from sales tax. The next big piece of the pie is other taxes, that's franchise fees and TOT. And then the smaller pieces of the pie are licenses and permits at 
uh, fines and penalties at not quite even 1%. Uh, intergovernmental, that's uh, revenues from other governments, not in, in to ourselves. And charges for services, both of those two are at 6%. Uh, refunds and reimbursements are one, other revenues are two, and use of money, rents and interest is one. So most of our revenue, I think the takeaway is most of our revenue comes from property and sales tax. And this is where the money goes, which that is a little more legible, I think, hopefully. And this is on, you can find this at Schedule 2 on page 30, 30 in, the, in the budget document. Um, and you see here where the money goes, 46% uh, of it is for police services. Um, that's the biggest chunk. Uh, the next big, biggest chunk is public works at 13%. And then we have finance and IT at 11%. And then some smaller ones there around the pie chart. So I wanted to give this, these two pie charts to you so you could see where is our money basically coming from and where is our money basically going. And I think that you know, the big takeaway is that most of the money comes from property and sales tax and most of the money goes into police and public works. And that one isn't even visible. The part of that pie that you can't even read <laughs> It says personnel costs. The big part there that's all blank, and it's 72 percent. So if we look at the general fund expenditures by type, we see that 72 percent of our costs are personnel costs. Maintenance and operations costs are 22 percent. That's the sort of reddish pie there, piece of the pie. And capital equipment and improvements is the little yellow piece of the pie, and that's at 6 percent. This one is a multi-year look at the general fund revenues and expense. That kind of pale green bar is the revenue and the red bar is the expense. And that goes from years, if you can't see it there, it's going from fiscal 09 through fiscal 18. And a couple of the things that I wanted to point out here is that and the last two groupings of bars are fiscal 17 and fiscal 18. And you'll see that in fiscal 18, the revenues drop off. And part of that is because of a cost allocation methodology change where the general fund is receiving less and transfers in from other funds for cost allocation. And the drop off in expenditures between 17 and 18 is primarily due to a redistribution of personnel costs that I talked about earlier, the utility billing clerks and the public works administration and so forth. Uh, this is property tax. That little line is going the direction we want it to. Mm -hmm. So, yippee. Sales tax. That little line is basically going in the same way too. That little blip there and fiscal between 16 and 17 is when we had an accounting methodology change. But if you smooth it out, you'll see that it's just basically an upward line. So that's good news. Transient occupancy tax is basically going up as well. Um, the 17 and 18 out there, the two, the last two years are Estimates, those are not actual numbers. All the other years are actual numbers. So, see the estimates are a little bit flat, but we'll see how it turns out when we get the actuals in. This is general fund expenditures, central service departments. Now, one of the things we talked about when we talked about cost allocation is that we have in the general fund two types of departments. One are central services, and these are the departments that provide services to operating departments and other funds. And so basically, these are the costs that get allocated through the cost allocation plan. So we have the fiscal 16-17 proposed budget and the 17-18. And the totals are a couple slides down, um, so you'll see those in a moment. These are the operating departments in the general fund. Um, so basically, operating departments are ones that provide services to the public more than they provide internal services. They do some internal services as well. You know, if we have trouble over here, the police department will respond. <laughs> so <laughs> there is some internal, but mostly they're operating departments and their services are provided to the public. Here are the totals on those. You see the year 16, 17, and 17, 18. 16, 17, the expenses are 14.2. 1718 or 12.8, and that's due to you know that reallocation of direct charging of things to the funds where the charges really belong. 
And so now let's talk about parks and recreation. Um, so this one has three, three bars for each year. The pale green bar that's going up is revenue. Mm. The reddish bar is expenses. And the pale yellow bar that's kind of going down from the baseline is the net subsidy. Now the thing to understand is that there probably isn't very many, if there are any, cities that are able to 100% fund parks and rec by the charges that you charge for parks and rec. Because you can't charge enough to fully support it. I mean, if we wanted to charge enough to fully support the pool, for instance, we might have to charge, I don't know, I haven't crunched the number, but you might have to charge $50 for a day pass. And that, you know, nobody's going to pay that. So the market can't bear that. And so as part of, you know, our community uh, programs that we offer and as part of the service to the community, we're going to provide parks and recreation and we're going to expect, most cities expect that there will be a general fund subsidy. So that's not a bad thing. But the thing that we need to, re to, to look at here and keep in the back of our minds is that <clears throat> there was a time when the Galt market was um, more fully funding parks and rec than it is now. And, and so <clears throat> through no fault of the parks and rec staff or the Galt market staff, you know, the marketplace has changed. You know, people are buying on the internet, they're not necessarily coming out to the market anymore. So, you know, that's something that we need to think about. And what are we going to do moving forward with the parks and with the Galt market? and with the Parks and Rec programs. So what we did is we did a little table here. You could see each one of the programs um, that Parks and Rec has, or the divisions. Their revenues, their expense, their central service costs, those are the share that they pay for finance and HR and all of those operations that were over there in the central service cost slide. And then we have the total expenses and the net, and we can see a subsidy right there. Our subsidy rate in total for Parks and Rec is 24%. You know, that is a really good number. I've, I've been in cities where that subsidy rate is much higher to like 60%, 50 or 60%. So, you know, we're doing good. We, we really have a beautiful gem and a great asset in that market because it's helping fund all of it. So, let's, uh, you know, let's talk a little bit about some of our challenges. I talked about the lowering of the CalPERS discount rate. I'm going to run that over again. Um, minimum wage is increasing every January through 2022 until in 2022 it's $15 an hour. And that will impact, as I mentioned before, that will impact our temporary and part-time employees, some of them. I mentioned the class and comp study. You know, we need to figure out what we're going to do with that. Deferred building maintenance. Um, Public Works has put together a list of the things that we should be doing to maintain our facilities and our buildings, but we haven't gotten to it. And, you know, last year I talked to you about deferred maintenance, and what I was telling you is that, you know, most cities did this during the recession, is they put off maintenance in order to be able to keep going and not have to, you know, take more drastic measures to keep going when all of the revenues fell off and the recession hit us, and that was something most cities did. Well, we're getting to a point where we really need to start addressing some of these issues, otherwise we're going to have more severe problems. Um, <clears throat> we have deferred vehicle purchases, that's an estimated dollar amount, and it's estimated because <clears throat> we're still in the process of analyzing what vehicles do we actually need. Um, we may or may not have the sufficient number of vehicles that we need or in, in a particular area, or we may have more vehicles than we need in one area. So we're, uh, interdepartmental directors getting together and figuring out what vehicles do we really need. And one of the things that we're going to do is propose, <coughs> hopefully soon, uh, a vehicle equipment replacement fund and to try and manage replacement of vehicles. And the idea there would be that, you know, departments and programs and funds would pay into that replacement fund and when it was time for them to replace the vehicle, the money would be available to do so. So that's kind of a complicated analysis and we'll be returning to you with that. Last year, well, fiscal 17, the year we're still in, but to me it's last year because my mind is in 18. We um, <coughs> spent a lot of money on IT. We did a lot of things to try and uh, resolve some of the problems that we found we had in IT, uh, but we're, we're still not totally caught up. There's still uh, an estimated $239,000 in things that we should be doing, but we have tackled the most critical items, and so you know, we will try and tackle these as well. 
we do have money in the in the proposed budget for some of the IT things, but not everything. And this is a number that represents unbudgeted items. So our financial planning next steps. <clears throat> Um, you really need to, if you're doing your personal finances, you know that you know, the first thing they're going to ask you if you sit down with a financial planner is, well, what do you want to do? You know, what are you planning for? So we need to figure out what do we want to do here as a city? What are we going to plan for? And then we know how we can attach dollars to that and how we can achieve what we want to achieve. I mean, if you have a child and you say, I want to be able to fund this child's college education, at some point you're starting to plan for that. And that's the kind of thing we mean when we're talking about financial planning. Um, we have, we need to review the existing and anticipated special assessment districts. We need to complete some proposed annexations. We need to evaluate infrastructure needs. One thing that's not in there in the deferred maintenance is what are we doing about our streets? And that's, you know, Mr. Winkler has presented a couple of reports since I've been here regarding the condition of our streets. And that's an issue that we really need to look at. You know, most recently, the, uh, the gas tax revenues are going to are projected to increase, and that will help, but that won't solve our problem. So that's something we need to evaluate and look at. Um, the, um, there's a cost of service study underway for sewer services. Um, we have really good financial policies, but many of them are dated. And then there's a few holes where we don't have a policy at all. And so we need to update those. That's a matter of just you know, doing your financial planning and organizing your housekeeping and, and just getting things developed. And then, like I said, we need a long-term financial plan or an economic plan, whatever you want to call it. So do you have any questions on the operating budget? Yes, I, Emily, on the, um, the pending challenges uh, uh, slide, could you go back to that? Is, is there a reason? Maybe explained it, and I missed it. Why we wouldn't include the cost allocation plan in there, in that it has created a financial hole. Um, yeah, there was a reason why I didn't put it there, and I didn't put it there because the items that are in there are currently unbudgeted, and so it's really not in there yet because we did budget it. And if you look at the numbers, you see that our general fund is upside down. Uh, and right. it's partly because of that cost allocation. So it's a hole in, in our, um, not a hole, it's a, uh, it is a challenge. And we need to find a way to right size our general fund budget because right now if you look at it, our expenditures are exceeding our revenues. And that's kind of not good. And I, I guess I, I bring that up is because it is a, a significant mm -hmm. issue. I mean, we've funded that hole with reserves yes. uh, for the next two years, yes. and reserves don't go on forever, so right. at some point we are going to have to um, um, address that issue. Uh, and, and it's a significant issue, because um, we're talking, what, one point, is it $1.6 million? Correct. If we look in the city manager's transmittal letter, and I probably should have had a slide on it, but we have that information on page eight of the transmittal letter. There is a chart, a table or a chart in there that tells you uh, what was our audited general fund balance at 630.16, which is our last audit. I generally try to tie financial numbers to an audited number, so you know they didn't come from me, they came from an independent auditor who looked at it and said, yeah, this is your number. We move forward from that. Um, and then we have, that our audited number then was 7.8 million, and then we have an established general fund reserve, and that's money that we put aside. It's like a savings account. If we have some kind of uh, catastrophe or disaster or an emergency in town, we have some money to cover that. So we set aside in our reserve 3.3 million. We also have in that 7.8 million balance there is money that's there's money in there that's really not available. And part of it is deferred loans and non-spendable items, um, such as you know, prepaid inventory really isn't, isn't spendable. And the majority, and that's 1.0 million. The majority of that is a subsidy to the Parks and Rec Fund of nearly a million dollars. So after that calculation, then on July 1st of 16, we had available 3.3 million dollars. If we look at our net results of operations, and that's revenues minus expense. Uh, we look at net results of operations as they're proposed for fiscal 17, it's a negative $545,000. So you subtract that 545 
from the 3.3 million and you're down now to 2.7 million available fund balance. And that's the estimated balance at 637T. Then we're looking at the proposed numbers for 1718 and we have the net results of operations again and that is a negative 668,000. So we take the 668 away from the 2.7 and we see that our projected um, fund balance in excess of reserves at 638T is 2.1 million. Now if we keep trending that way, it's going to be zero. And then we're going to have to go back and look at the money we set aside in the savings account for emergencies and say maybe we better use that. We don't want to get to that point. And, and I agree, Mr. Campion, we, I really should have hit harder on that point, maybe a slide on it as well, because it is extremely vital, extremely critical, and we need to address that. Additionally, the 2.1 million at the 638 team has not yet subtracted the subsidy for fiscal 18 for Parks and Rec. So there's another million dollars. million dollars. And if you look at the bottom of that page, you'll see that fiscal 18, the 2.1 million minus the 1.0 for the Parks and Rec subsidy, um, minus the 114,000 for the L and L subsidy, leaves us with $919,000. Now we're starting to get into uh, really, I don't want to use the word scary, but it's starting to get into a territory where we really need to sit back and plan what are we going to do and how are we going to address this. And um, that's something that the directors have talked about. It's something that we're planning to sit down and go through our budgets. And, and we really need to find a solution to this. We can't turn our backs on it because we will reach a point when that balance is zero if we don't address it. I, I, uh, and I, I heard what you said about, you know, it's great that, that, that the general fund only has to uh, subsidize the Parks and Rec operations by 25%. Correct. Um, but the flip side of that is, is Galt is the only community in California that runs a market to generate money restricted for that purpose. So, and historically, as you pointed out, it was able to fully fund in the past whatever the, whatever the park and rec operational costs were in addition to market operations. So it was, you know, it, I don't know that it made any money, but it didn't, it wasn't dipping into general fund uh, reserves or operations uh, monies in order to uh, make it through the fiscal year. I think, I think the council really needs to you know, look at and think about, I, I see it as three, three items. Uh, one is, is the cost allocation plan mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I know it is what it is. My question with the cost allocation plan, you talk about uh, direct charges um, versus the central services uh, which is basically public works. How is it being accomplished, like with the police department or uh, finance uh, mm -hmm. or building or planning? How, how is that going to be addressed in direct services? Because I don't know that how much money that's going to be, but I think that rather than waiting to implement something, it should be sooner rather than later. Okay. So let me comment on cost allocation uh, first. Um, Every operating department places a burden on the central service departments. The police department, for example, and I'm not singling you out, Chief, the police department places a burden on central services. You know, they have, they use HR, they use finance, they use the city attorney and the city manager, so they place a burden on it. And through the cost allocation methodology as we proposed it, um, their bur the burden that each operating department, even if they're in the general fund, the burden that they place on central services is evaluated and calculated and for police services, for instance, because they're a general fund operation, their central service cost just stays in the general fund instead of being charged to other funds. Right. So am I on track with where you're going with that? I think I veered. Well, assuming it's any other department which is non-general fund, I mean, in, mm -hmm. I can't think of an example. Well, uh, they run into a water tank. Is that, is that a direct service charge if they're out there providing security? Someone hits a, you know, a, a water hydrant. Right. Um, there, there are a couple of different schools of thought on that. There has been some cities that have decided or, or determined that police services should be charged to utility funds because police services is also policing those areas. 
Um, we chose not to include that in this particular cost allocation plan because there has been a lot of conversations that I've heard about whether or not you should really do that, and so we chose not to. Um, evaluating that, I think if we looked at it really objectively, we'd have to evaluate, well, how many hours, we have to make some estimate, estimation of um, perhaps um, the size of the city and the size of the utilities and how much are they really uh, patrolling or, or serving those facilities. And it, um, I would guess that it's not going to be that much because, you know, the property-wise or the, the acreage or size-wise, those utilities aren't taking up a whole lot or I wouldn't pick the percentage of those it's very great, but I could be wrong. In other departments, such as planning, are they, where they work on different projects that are part mm -hmm. of central service Correct. public works, yes. how would that be accomplished in terms of the direct service charge? Well, planning and public works engineers, what we have done is we have developed a system by which they can direct charge their time to projects. So if an engineer works on a CIP project, um, they will record that on their timesheet and we will direct charge that to the CIP fund that's that has that project, that uh, funds that project. Okay. Um, and planning, um, if they're working on something, um, if they're working on, let's say they're doing something, we did a wastewater treatment plant, in, in pr huge improvement project, so let's just say that planning was needing to go out there and inspect it, so they would put on their timesheet the amount of time they spent working on the utility project, and we would direct charge that time to the utility fund. Um, that way you have a real good trail of how much time these uh, employees spent working on those projects. Uh, and what it eliminates is, it eliminates the, the likelihood that, or the possibility that these utility funds or capital improvement project funds would get charged more than they should be charged. Um, we're trying to develop what is a fair and equitable sure. uh, cost allocation. Well, that was, that was the whole basis of the prior plan, but I think it got out of skew over time, and that was the, that was the big problem. Um, I, I say, get, getting back to Parks and Rec, and, and, I, and you know, it is, we're not going to solve it tonight, but I, I think that there are, you know, several big items that, that staff, that I think council needs to be concerned with, and, and, and obviously staff, and, and that is developing a plan um, sooner rather than later again on how we address uh, the, the, the implementation of the cost allocation plan mm -hmm. and the declining re revenues in um, the general fund because at the end of about year two, year three, I don't know that we have any reserves available, do we? We wouldn't have any reserves, at, uh, we wouldn't have any fund balance in excess of the established reserve. At that point, we would start, have to start dipping into our savings account, our established reserve, which, you know, that's... Not, not, not optimal. That, that shouldn't happen. Yeah. No. So, so I guess what I'm saying is I would like to have council briefed, uh, you know, on a semi-regular basis, mm -hmm. you know, maybe every four to six months. Where, where, how are we making progress on these big issues? Because not only that, but you know, you bring up the the class and comp study, um, and we've looked at that. It's a public document now. Uh, it shows that uh, salaries and benefits uh, uh, for city employees here are Mm -hmm. uh, significant, in some cases, significantly underpaid mm -hmm. compared to surrounding areas, and that's another big issue. Um, you know, the employees here need to be treated fairly, and uh, that's going to be a challenge, mm -hmm. a significant challenge. Um, so I think any, anything associated, well, in the purge, you bring that right, up, right. those are all costs, and I don't see anything on the revenue side that's going to offset these increases, and it quite frankly scares me. You know, it is intimidating. I agree. Um, and I also agree that it's not something that staff can solve on their own. It's not mm -hmm. something the council can solve on their own. It needs to be a joint effort. And Mr. Palazzo, did you want to say something? I'm, I'm, I'm gearing up. Yeah. All right, let me know. I'll stop talking. <laughs> um, yeah, we, we definitely need to have some joint efforts here to solve this problem. And, and I agree, we can report back to you more frequently about where we're at on these things. Sure, and, and I, I think, you know, uh, obviously I don't think we're not the professionals up here to come up with uh, the, the ideas, but I, I think that, uh, you know, staff uh, certainly float whatever ideas or thoughts or, or proposed plans before the council, and, and I think that's what has to happen. It has to happen, again, sooner rather than later. 
Maybe I kind of chime in here, Mayor, Council sure. members. Yeah, yeah, and thank you, you know, Emily, finance uh, staff, and directors, and all staff. You have worked well, well hard in, in getting this budget to you this evening. And you know, we have some hurdles. Uh, you know, our next step, you know, in these hurdles is, is really getting with the council and having a strategic plan session, and looking at at our priorities. Uh, at what, how do we serve uh, the community? And it's not going to be only one little thing that's going to help us elevate out of out of the deficit. Um, we run pretty lean you know, in the departments over the last uh, 10 years with the recession. You know, you know our, our departments have, have really you know gone you know, to a lot of efficiencies. We've cut you know our costs, um, and I'm very impressed with you know how, how we operate. There are probably some other efficiencies you know that you know we're starting to talk with our directors. Uh, on you know, taking a look at, you know, so there are other things that you know, we'll bring to the council and, and talk about. But I think the first step is, you know, having that strategic plan session, getting some ideas out on the table, um, starting to implement, you know, you know, you know, what services, what levels of service uh, we provide. Are there programs uh, out there that maybe you know we want to take a look at and, and and not, you know, you know, do those programs anymore. Um, are there cost savings you know, you know, to that? Uh, and, and on the other side, it's the economic development. You know, how do we uh, increase our revenues? And you know, what are our priorities in the next two years? Uh, you know, clearly we're focusing on you know, annexation of the industrial area. Uh, we're trying to work with you know, property owners um, in developing uh, additional properties. We're looking at this you know, 45 acres here uh, uh, that where City Hall sits in, in the market. Um, in the budget this year, made some uh, decisions. Adding uh, a, a position it is, it was a big struggle for me, but the position in the Parks and Rec uh, Department uh, to have a league event coordinator to take a look at the league events and try and help us get um, you know you know promote those events, but also promote the market and you know see if we can fill the market you know the other five days a week with with something. To start generating more revenue is very important you know, to our business plan. And, you know, small steps, and we may have to adjust. Uh, you know, later on in the year on, on some of these items, but again, it's you know, really getting with the council, probably in September, um, early October, to start you know that strategic plan process. By January, uh, February, we're going to have to have some sort of plan put together. So because you know we're going into the next two-year budget cycle, and by the time we get into that next two-year budget cycle. We really need to have that five-year plan, uh, financial plan, economic plan, you know, kind of established or at least, you know, in some form that we know where we're going so we can adopt that t next two-year budget and, you know, you know, see how we can uh, uh, move out of that deficit. Any other? <coughs> So I'm glad we're going to schedule the strategic planning. I think that needs to be done sooner than later. <laughs> um, because obviously, when I look at the budget, um, this isn't going to, we aren't going to be able to get out of, um, to make things right and to quit having expenditures exceed revenue. It's not going to be done by some big thing happening. It's going to be done by all those little things. And, you know, in the last couple of years, I over and over have said we need to look at those little things and the amount of money that we um, provide to things that aren't public safety, that aren't the services that we are required to provide, that we're here to provide, the public works, the building, the public safety. And I think that at some point, you know, um, when I read this, that we need to look at all those little things and decide until we either have the, re until the revenues grow enough to cover all the expenditures, we need to look at all those small expenditures we're making because they're going to make a difference in the, in the long run. And um, we really do need to value our employees and we need to, um, they have, we need to make them a priority and it's going to be very difficult to do when we continue to provide funding to other, other things rather than that services that we're mandated to provide. So I'm, um, you know, it's, it's a bitter pill to swallow. But uh, I think that, uh, you know, you have a good plan and we can move forward. I just don't want to see us two years from now not have a plan 
on how we're going to correct this. Well, I think that's the consensus of everybody, and that's what everyone's been saying. We need to pull up our bootstraps to try to figure out, and as Council Member Campion says, we do have to look at some things. Uh, we've got to look at increasing our revenues and sometimes uh, in some way getting rid of a lot of our expenses if we're going to be viable, and that's with everybody in every way and every day, even when you're trying to get your house in order that way. So um, those are the things that... Um, we're all aware of that we've got to uh, get together and figure out. I, I think we've got a good group here, and I think we can do it. Um, okay, so uh, where am I? Because do we have to, uh, is there a motion or no? Pardon? Okay, okay. We need a motion to, uh... go ahead, Donna. Let me read the recommended action. Yes, please. Okay. Recommended action. Receive the 2016-2018 recommended biannual budget adjustments. Two, solicit public input. Three, provide direction to staff on any proposed changes or modification to the recommended budget. Do I have a motion? So moved. Do I have a second? Did you open it to the public? Oh, it's sorry. Not a, it's not a public hearing. Say that again. No. No public. Okay, open it. There is no public comment. I'll close it. Sorry. Okay, uh, Council Member Hewer made a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, uh, let's go with Lampson this time. Okay, call for the vote, please. Vice Mayor Cruz? Aye. Council Member Hewer? Aye. Council Member Campion? Aye. Council Member Lampson? Aye. Mayor Powers? Aye. Approved uh, 5 to 0. Okay, now we're going to go down to uh, number three, and that's the master fee schedule update. And oh, we had to do this. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, you keep making me move everything around. Okay, uh, we're at the Capital Improvement Program Budget Adjustment Fiscal Years. Yes, and I stayed standing here because that's my item as well. Well, apparently don't go anywhere either after that. Yeah, I know. I have another item after that. That's right. <laughs> yeah, you'll hear a lot from me tonight, I guess. So, um, the uh, Capital Improvement Program is a long-range capital planning document. And we put in there a five-year plan for how we're going to, we're proposing to build various things. And uh, what we're asking you to approve is a five-year plan that you're in agreement with what we're planning to build. Um, but what also what we're only asking you to uh, appropriate money for fiscal 17 and fiscal 18. So you only appropriate the money for two years, but you look at the five years and, and, uh, and adopt the whole plan. Um, and the plan and the documentation includes, you know, uh, there are, in the back of your binders, there are project sheets that explain each one of the projects and what's happening with it. And um, these numbers are a teeny bit small, but um, I think we can struggle through it. Um, this are completed projects. These are projects that reached their termination or were finally completed in fiscal 17. Most of these are multi-year projects. So the numbers there were not, the 38 million was not something that was spent in fiscal 17. That's the accumulated total for these projects. The first project listed there, Littleton Stowe, so we left off the rest of it because it was renovation cost as well. There was uh, painting and roofing and um, carpeting, I think, were the items that were there in Littleton. Um, and then we know we have the wastewater treatment plant upgrade project, live oak pump station, uh, some, a water treatment plant operations, water meters. You know, we got the water meters installed and we've got the billing going on the water meters now and that's all up and completed. Um, pedestrian enhancements, facilities planning. Well, these are the projects that are, are underway in, in construction right now. Um, Walker Park, we're putting up those, those field lights. You know, if you look at the Walker Park project, there's other phases, future phases in there, but this is what we're working on right now. Um, Aquatic Center renovation, Monterey Bay Well, Lift Station Rehab, Galt Market Improvements, Chibolo re Renovation, 4th Street, you know, we've been hearing a lot about 4th Street lately. Um, things that are not under construction yet but are in the planning stage. Uh, I'm not going to read all of those to you. You can you can see what they are. Uh, 
And then we have projects that really go beyond the five years. They're, they're out there, they're things that we need to do, but they're not really yet in the five-year plan because they're further, further out. Um, additional phases to the Walker Park, for example, the Harvey Park expansion, and uh, improvements to water and wastewater and sewer capacity, storm drains, you know, all of those kinds of things that we will be needing to do in the future. And then this one is also pretty small, but I'll try and help you out with it. This is the proposed uh, budget. So let me see if I can find my notes. The general improvements, um, don't confuse that with general fund. That just means general facility improvements. Included there in fiscal 17 is the library expansion, um, proposed construction. Um, that's 1.3 million for which we do not have not yet identified a funding source. So when you look at the CIP document, you'll see a line that says unfunded. But we put it in there so we have an idea that this is something we want to do once we find funding for it. Um, fiscal 18, there are some unfunded in there as well. That's for annexations of Twin Cities, industrial area, and so forth. Um, the Fourth Street. Um, Fourth Street's also in here in general improvements, but that's being funded by um, CDBG mostly. Some parks and recreation projects, the big number there in 18, that 3.2 is a projection. I think it's all Walker Park, mostly Walker Park. Um, transportation projects, those are, you know, your streets. Uh, wastewater and water projects, drainage projects, and some minor amounts there for equipment. That's things like, uh, you know, major equipment purchases or some vehicles. And that's really short and sweet kind of the CIP presentation. Are there any questions on that one? And do we need to open it for public comment? I'm not sure of the exact procedure. To open the public hearing. The public hearing. The public hearing. Okay. We're going to open it for public hearing. Is there anyone that has no speaker sheets? Okay, we're going to close it. Okay, can we have, uh, can we, we need to approve the resolution adopting the adjustments to the five year capital improvement program 2017 to 2021. Do I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Okay, we've got Vice Mayor Cruz and Council Member Lampson. I just have a question for Emily. Yes. Um, so many of these projects are unfunded. There are yeah. unfunded things, yes. I, I just, would have been nice if we had identified for the public which ones are unfunded. Oh, yeah. but, uh, because it doesn't really show up. I mean, I get, when you read our report, it shows up, but it doesn't yeah. show up on there. Things like the library expansion, I mean, there's no funding for that. Right. Um, so when we do the CIP, like the ones that are underway, and mm -hmm. so we just we are just looking for funding for many of these other projects. There's. Um, these are things that were identified in the strategic plan. It's like Mr. Winkler would like to comment on that. Well, I could probably help a little. Um, so we have projects that have either been identified as as part of you know the city's desires, and we by putting them in the capital improvement program, we identify them as there is no identified funding source, but we will look for grants, we'll look for SACOG opportunities. Uh, uh, the Community Development Department just brought in a, a half million dollar grant to help us with some of the master planning, some of these things. So we, we identify the need, uh, but we have yet to identify a hard construction, the library being a great example. We've got money for design, which is underway. Um, and, uh, and we just held a kickoff meeting this past week uh, with the new architectural firm that will be taking us to, uh, through, through the design process. Uh, but we've yet to identify the construction funding of about a million and a half dollars estimated. So we'll be, in the meantime, looking for grants or coming up with a financing plan uh, of options for how we might finance that type of project. Yeah. I'm just concerned that the community understand just because something is on the CIP oh, yeah. list that that yeah. doesn't mean that it's going to happen unless we get funding for those things to happen. I think that's a very good point and, and I want you to, you and Mr. Campion, his comment on the operating budget to know that 
um, we appreciate comments where we can improve our presentations, and, and I think that's a good comment. My superstars back there will make note of it and make sure I don't forget. <laughs> but you did a great job. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, anyone else before I call for the vote? Okay, call for the vote, please. Vice Mayor Cruz? Aye. Council Member Hewer? Aye. Council Member Campion? Aye. Council Member Lampson? Aye. Mayor Powers? Aye. Pass 5 to 0. Okay, now we're at the master fee schedule update. Okay, now this one is also a public hearing and there is no PowerPoint for it. I'm just going to talk to you. <laughs> so this is an update of user fees. User fees are those that are the charges that we, we uh, the charges that we charge people who use, um, they're basically they elect to use these services. Like they elect to use the pool, or they elect to, you know, build something, or you know, it's it's really, you know, it's not a tax where people don't have to pay it. They elect to use the service, so they need to pay for the service. Mm -hmm. And all of the fees that are proposed are um, less than or equal to what it costs the city to provide the service. Um, we are in compliance with Prop 26 on that. Resolution 2015-72, which you know a couple years back, provided for an annual CPI increase on user fees, and that this is that presentation. Um, the CPI that we're using is the February of 2017 All Urban Consumer for San Francisco Oakland area, and it is 3.437 percent. And what we do is we. Uh, calculate that amount on the existing fee and then we round it up to the or round it up or down to the nearest whole dollar. Some of the fees and I'm, I'm just going to talk briefly about fees that are changed in other ways. I'm not going to go through all of the fees that have been CPI adjusted. So in Parks and Rec we did some adjustments to get those fees closer to market rate. So some of them increased just a little bit more than CIP because they had not been increased for a number of years. And then other fees remained static where there was no increase because we did that evaluation of what will the market bear. So like I said before, we probably we cannot charge what it costs us to provide many of these parks and rec services. We would just price ourselves out of the market. Um, <coughs> additionally, in 2013, Resolution 1304 uh, provided for nonprofit rentals um, to or nonprofits to be able to rent Littleton or Chibola uh, once a year free, and so that resolution was adopted in 2013, but it hadn't been added to the schedule, so we've added it to the schedule. So we have all the user fees in one place. Community development created an additional minor use permit. So that if a, if there's a project that only needs staff review, they don't have to pay the higher uh, amount, which would be needed if they need staff review and planning commission. So it makes it more equitable for the smaller things that really just need staff review. They don't need to go to planning commission. Um, <clears throat> public works, we added a bulk construction fee for larger construction projects with usage based on the city's irrigation rate. That's where a big construction pro project might want an elevated tank with water, or they want the tanker trucks or water trucks or whatever they're called. Utility fees, we're recommending a couple of fees there that are new. One is a water services damage fee. We found that we have a few customers occasionally who destroy or alter or damage the water meters and we want to be able to charge them for those repairs. So that's only on damages. We're not going to try and charge people for routine when we go look at your water meter or anything. We charge them if they destroy our water meters. Um, and then there's a special billing fee, which <coughs> we're proposing because we have some commercial customers that have non-standard irrigation or meter configurations, and so we can't run those usage rates through our uh, billing system. We have to manually calculate them. And we'd like to encourage those customers, there are not very many of them, but we'd like to encourage them to um, standardize their meter system so we don't have to spend time doing that. But at the same time, we would like to be able to recover our costs for doing so. So that's a recommended new fee as well. And um, those are the primary changes. Do you have any questions for me? I have uh, one or two. Oh, on the, uh, and I understand the change in the minor use permit. 
Um, will those not require public notice then? There's no noti notification provided? Uh, if we go to planning commission with a minor use permit, I do do public notice. We do, uh, correct. But, how but we do, if we don't go to planning commission, we do report out to the planning commission at the next meeting. Next meeting. But if it's an actual use permit, it doesn't that, that doesn't that require public notice and public hearing? Um, it, it does not. It's a staff level review for minor use permit. We, since I've been at the city, we have never done a public hearing for a minor use permit. I just couldn't remember the distinction between the major and the minor. So the way the way the minor use permit is set up, it's either staff level review or if there is some unique feature of the request that I think requires or uh, the department thinks uh, requires the public hearing and the planning commission review we will punt it to planning commission and so for example uh, we had two projects in the industrial zone one was a, uh, a use permit for a uh, hairdresser and another was for the cell tower there but they both had the same fee even though we moved one to planning commission for review the cell tower so we, we felt we needed to have that separate fee structure. Um, the other two questions uh, under development agreements and specific plan preparation. Uh, under specific plan, it just says deposit. Uh, under the development agreement, it says actual cost with a deposit. So am I to assume that uh, it, it's going to be consultant prepared? But what about staff's time? Is that well? We, you know, that's uh, that's. A good question. Uh, the way I would envision that is, yes, it would be a consultant paying for, or sh I should say the applicant paying for the consultant to prepare either document, and then their additional fee will be for staff time. So I don't think we've identified uh, the amount to basically pay for deposit, uh, but by having the deposit, uh, if it is exceeded, we have the ability to, to ask for additional funding. Okay. For or additional fees from the applicant, and that would cover staff costs. Correct. Well. Yeah, and that's the intent. The other, like an environmental document, we typically just tacked on 20% extra. Okay. And is there a fee for uh, in here? And I can't, I couldn't find it. I thought I saw it earlier. Maybe not. Um, um, for utility shutoffs. Is there a utility shutoff fee here? Mm -hmm. there, well, it's a utility turn back on fee. Turn, turn on fee. Yeah. Once we've shut them off, if they want it back on, there is a fee for that. Um, I don't know. Is that in our fee schedule or is that in the utility code? It's in the utility code. It is. Right, rather than the user fee schedule. Because that whole process seems somewhat antiquated to me in that you warn them that they're going to get shut off and then you have to go out and give them a hanger. Yeah. And is that door hanger, is that required by law? The door hanger is required by law. There are statutory requirements for turning the utilities off and certain notices you have to give, and there's a pretty onerous set of requirements, including the door hanger and the languages they need to be in. Wow. That seems... Well, we're actually doing two notifications. We're doing a telephone notification through the voice-activated system where they get a phone call if they're on the shutoff list and they're, they're advised that they will be shut off at such and such a date. So we're giving them notice in that fashion as well as the door hangers. There's a whole chapter in the Public Utilities Code that very, is very prescriptive as to what process and how many days between notices and shutoffs and, and if they have a medical a validated medical excuse, they can put that on file with the city. And so uh, it is antiquated, but it's antiquated by statute. Okay. That's all I had on that. Okay, Council, anyone else? I have a couple questions. Armando, the Little Tinchaboya Community Center rental fees, um, is it, it looks like in the staff report that it's generally used by nonprofits, that we're generally waiving the fee on most of the usage of those facilities? Uh, the majority of the usage is by nonprofits. And the fees waived then? Yes, for the, for the first time. And then they have a nonprofit uh, fee if they rented it more than one time per calendar year. Okay. So when we waive the fee for the first rental, um, I know that the, part of the agreement is that they clean up, that your staff still has to go in and redo to bring it up to the standard of being ready for the next. Cor correct. They're they're required to sweep, mop, clean, um, put away tables, and then public works staff, uh, the janitorial staff, comes in and gets it rental ready again. You know, they're 
these nonprofits aren't going to go behind the toilet and scrub it. They're mm -hmm. not going to scrub the toilet as as it's going to be needed to, to to rent it again. So yes, we do go back in. So we we take a big loss on the uh, not a big loss, but we take a loss on those. Wa it's not just that we're waiving the fee. We're also taking a loss. We, we are taking a loss on staff time, supplies, uh, utilities and wear and tear on the building because people do lean up against the wall with their feet, they damage chairs, they damage tables, things get used, things get Other used. Collection, yeah. crab feet. Um, and we were notified that there will be an additional collection starting next year for the crab feeds, a $50 cleaning fee for the containers. So it will be another cost that we'll have to incur. And I'm very concerned that, that the Littleton Center has about a million dollars in deferred maintenance um, and that if at some point we don't start looking at a revenue base for the Littleton Center, we're not going to have it because we're not going to be able to afford um, the upkeep on the building for organizations to be able to use the facility, to be able to have the facility um, that takes a direct hit out of the general fund. As we've talked about, we don't have it to give. and um, I'm just very concerned that as a community we need to maintain that facility and one of the only ways that we're going to be able to maintain that facility is that we start looking at a revenue stream and the main usage of that facility is by nonprofits and I believe that the council needs to revisit the issue about whether or not we continue to um, waive the fees for all nonprofits using the facility um, because I can foresee in the future it's an aging building. I mean, it's getting old. We've replaced the stoves. That was a you know $150,000 project. Um, there's other things that need to be replaced. It's it's an aging building, and we have no um, revenue or no way of having revenue to um, upkeep that building. And I, it concerns me because I think that uh, it's a wonderful treasure for the facility for the community that we have the facilities. But if we don't maintain them, they're not going to be here. So I just think that we need to at some point revisit that um, issue. I wasn't on the council when that decision was made. And I think that at some point, um, you know, I think the nonprofits need to understand that we're not going to have that facility if we don't start contributing to the upkeep of that facility. Well, thank you. Well, um, I'm kind of surprised that we have to go back in and clean up and everything. There probably should be some fee for using it for just the cleanup or anything starting off there or something. Yeah, we do need to re to adjust it. But we also have to remember that this was only a year ago and the maintenance that we have needed on that place is over 20 years old. So mm -hmm. it, 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 maybe, maybe we have to start looking forward, but it didn't just happen yesterday. Oh, no, I agree. So Armando? I know most of it is for nonprofits, so maybe when you come back and report, we can know what else, who else uses it. Do the, do the is there still gymnastics? We, and we do it for, we have our uh, classes in there, children's musical theater, uh, gymnastics. We have a facility use agreement with the school districts. They'll use it for some of their events and um, then private rentals. We do have private rentals that we do uh, get some revenue for those facilities. And I do believe for Shabola, you have a basketball and things that go on in there too. Shabola is strictly for nonprofit and city use. Okay. Um, so there are no private rentals uh, for Shabola. That was a decision also made that uh, they wanted to keep that in a better condition, long-term use mm -hmm. um, of the council at the time. If you want us to revisit that, let us know. I'd be glad to take any direction from council on which. Well, the. Uh, the other thing at Chibola, at Chibola, it's not just nonprofits. It's a bunch, it's a bunch of parks and recreation um, programs, correct? That's correct. We, it's it's a so city facility. We use that for our karate, uh, right. you know, gymnastics. Our our senior programs and are based out of there. Right. But we don't. And I think we need out. to get at the place where, like everyone says, we need to see if it's profitable. If we're, you know, if some of these programs are not. Profitable, we're losing money. But I can tell you, our rec programs are close to recouping 100%. Okay. There are okay. programs that that aren't going to make money. We subsidize lights for our uh, sporting youth groups. Uh, we have a $10 per player fee, which allows them to use our 
facilities for free. We, you know, we're we're just not recouping our costs on some of these programs. So there, you know, if you'd like us to look at those type of programs where where we're subsidizing other organizations, we'd be glad to do that through Parks and Rec. Thank you. No, I was just. I was just going to ask, how do we compare to surrounding communities? I mean, with regard to um, program fees, we're we're comparable. We we are comparable to Lodi, El Grove. We look at those. Um, even our rentals, we'll compare the two cities, El Grove and Lodi, particularly, and then try and fit in that area. Our particularly our aquatic swim team. When we were looking at uh, uh, fees, we were pretty much right there in the middle of, of our, our league fees. So but they the Lodi's they use some of the high school pools down there, don't they? Correct. But we were looking at only at our swim teams that are in our conference, not Lodi because Lodi uh, swims against Lodi kids. Right. It's a it's a organization within the Lodi group. I see. I see. Where we travel to Sacramento, Woodland, Folsom yeah, well, once again, the bummer is they're bigger cities with bigger budgets. Yeah. And, and those, <laughs> right back where we started. those groups are private groups uh, for the majority where they're renting the pool that they're in. And uh, we're using, it's a city program that uh, using a city facility. I think that's a, some info. I would like to, I'd be interested to see what they rent things for. I mean, because if we're, you know, providing the same level of, of, uh, of service, um, I think we need to, you can't compare, those, those aren't comparable then. Um, if, if it's a privately run and they're renting a facility, whereas right. they're not here, yeah. I mean, maybe your, your team fees go up, but we're still going to run it. But I think we need to look at it, you know, maybe a little bit more as a business because obviously it's um, loses 75% yeah. in the budget. That's a lot. <laughs> so, right. and, and we have raised the fees the last two years, and in here, I believe there's a, another uh, increase to to that program. But they all seem pretty modest. I mean, I, I from what I recollect. Well, and we're seeking a new um, person that will go out and market us and try to get events. Correct. We will be uh, trying to bring in more tournaments. Walker Park is underutilized on the weekends for tournament play. We have a lot of the local groups that will come in, but they're not drawing in teams from out of the area. Right. I'd be interested to know in the like the light cost, how much it costs to run the the lights at night compared to what we charge the out of town people to see if we can recoup some of that. I know lights are really, that's probably the biggest expense out there. It's probably the biggest one that we're subsidizing okay. uh, because uh, I believe right now we are charging twenty dollars an hour, and at the time we did the staff report, the costs were coming in around thirty five dollars per hour, so we're subsidizing at about fifteen dollars per hour. The lights. Correct. That's it. Less that's than I thought they'd be. Well, that's something. That well, Fifteen dollars an hour. Yeah. Seven days a week. Yeah. During the fall, it 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 adds up. That's something that has to be looked at again. Yeah. And we did I, that before. And and, and yeah. then the ten dollar per player fee. Yeah. We have a football group that uses Walker Park for their home games, so that four or five home games, you know, it it's included in that ten dollar per player fee. So we get four hundred dollars for the year, but they use it for practice. They use it for games. The lights are at a reduced cost, so there's a lot of programs out there that right. that we, if you want us to look at, we'd be glad to look at and report back. Be interested in, in some what information and data is out there. Yeah, the lights have been a big deal for a while. Just kind of, well, with the new lights we're getting in too, that'd be. And and we would have to go back and look at that too. I mean, the when we did that staff report, we were at the the old lights. We have new efficient LED lights that we're putting in, so each facility would be a little different. Okay, I'd really like to see, like on the facilities, when staff have to go back in and, and do the, the deep cleaning sort of stuff, how much time it, that takes, so, so how much we are, you know, financially how much we're losing when they go in and clean those facilities yeah, I think and so. what the extra cost is to us because, you know, many of those events that are held there are fundraisers for those organizations. And I'm not saying that we need to charge them the thousand dollars that we charge a private organization to rent the facility, but I think we need to be at least somewhere close to breaking even. Because I think sometimes when we talk about providing support to to nonprofits in the community, everybody forgets those kind of things that we provide support to the community in. 
and those things never get looked at as, as what the cost is. I mean, we talk about the 85000 that's being done in the special events, but all of this adds up too and starts looking at that cost that we're not recouping in any way. Correct. Would you like me to also include the heating and air, that type mm -hmm. of cost also? Okay. This would be a fully loaded cost. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I yeah, it's, been, it's really a shame that you have to go in and clean up after somebody that's supposed to be cleaning up. You know. Okay. I'm gonna. If that's it. I'm gonna open the public hearing. Have anyone want to speak? Close the public hearing. Okay. Has everyone said their piece about this? Okay. Um, can I have a motion? Motion to adopt resolution. Okay. Second. Second. Okay, we've got Council Member Hewer and Council Member Lampson. Call for the vote, please. Vice Mayor Cruz? Aye. Council Member Hewer? Aye. Council Member Campion? Aye. Council Member Lampson? Aye. Mayor Powers? Aye. Uh, okay, I'm not totally confused. We're at discretionary funds Campion right now. Okay, it's to you, Council Member Campion. Uh, as in the report, uh, I had some carryover funds and funds for this year. Um, Carry over the amount of 400 I'd like to allocate to the Harvest uh, Carnival Community Outreach uh, event that reaches out to about 1,200 people, mostly children in the community in October, Halloween. Um, and uh, the McFarland Home, um, I think some of you were at an event, they had a completion here recently. Um, it is in need of uh, exterior paint. That bill is going to run about thirteen, fourteen thousand dollars. So the thousand dollars here would just go towards um, assisting with that. So that is my request. Okay. Uh, do I have a motion to approve? Who sponsors the harvest? Is it it's it's sponsored by. Uh, it's held at the uh, Horizon uh, Church, but it is co-sponsored by uh, a number of them in the community. There's probably. Well, I think it varies, but anywhere from five to six. Churches? Or? Churches. Okay. Yeah. But it is, it's open to the public, uh, and it's a safe safe place for Halloween. Yeah. They have a petting zoo and all sorts of stuff, so I think it's a good... Um, it actually is a very good, good event. Um, okay. Do I have a motion to approve? Don't everybody speak up at once. So moved. Uh, do I have a second? Second. Okay. Lampson and Cruz, call for the vote, please. Vice Mayor Cruz. Aye. Council Member Hewer? Aye. Council Member Campion? Aye. Council Member Lampson? Aye. Mayor Powers? Aye. Okay, the Sacramento Smud Shine Awards Program application. Amy, that's to you. I didn't want to run up here and not actually be on my agenda item, so <laughs> speaking over Cora's agenda really quick. This color looks amazing on. <laughs> need, we, I, I think we need to double check these before they. Apparently, um, like. Emily and I are on the um, you guys come in same templates it. here. Good evening, Mayor and members of Council. Amy Mendes, Economic Development Manager. I am here this evening to talk to you about the SMUD Shine Award. Um, SMUD, which is the Sacramento Municipal Utility District, our local utility provider recently announced a community sponsorship program called the Shine Awards. SMUD is inviting nonprofits located in and serving communities in SMUD's ter service territory to apply for the um, Shine Awards program. Funding for the, um, well I should say that the purpose of the program is to provide funding for projects that will improve and revitalize our local neighborhoods to help them shine. The grant program is, is pretty broad in terms of um, what they are looking to um, provide funding for. And so we thought this would be a great opportunity for the city to partner with a um, local organization to go after funding for a project for the city. And we are um, in talks with the Chamber of Commerce. And so I apologize, this is pretty difficult to read, but um, to be eligible for the program, um, you must be an incorporated nonprofit um, and operate within SMUD's ter service territory. Um, so community-based nonprofits um, are um, uh, able to apply um, chambers of commerce, property-based business improvement districts, 
um, HOAs, um, organizations of uh, those natures. Municipal organizations can apply if you have a partner, and so um, we had talked to the chamber about potentially putting together an application for funding. SMUD is kind of loud. Um, they are encouraging collaboration with um, joint agencies, and so we uh, would like to take advantage of the program and try to obtain some funding for a wayfinding signage program is what we're looking at. Eligible project types that they've given examples of are neighborhood improvement, um, STEM education, energy efficiency programs, and beautification. So it is pretty broad. And what we did is originally um, we had some discussions with the uh, Old Town property and business owners. So an Old Town Summit was held some time ago and we discussed different projects and different things that the Old Town business and property owners were looking for in the Old Town area. One of the items that brought up was, was brought up during the discussions was signage. And a couple weeks ago, we talked about this program in particular to get some feedback on if we were going to go after funding for a small project for the Old Town area, what they would be looking for. With everything else in terms of options that we provided, wayfinding signage really came as the number one thing that they were interested in. One of the things that they have difficulty in is sort of branding themselves as an old town area, getting people off of the freeway from the Galt Market to work, know where they're located at. We talked about a gateway sign, and gateway signage isn't something they were looking for. They actually wanted signage directing people to the old town area. So the um, different kinds of awards that and sponsorship levels that um, SMUD is offering is... Amy, we're getting feedback, so maybe you better talk into the microphone if you don't mind, please. We'll turn it down. Is that better? Yeah. Just feel like it's really loud as long as I'm not blowing well, my eardrums out. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> the SPARK sponsorship is for up to $10,000, and so um, that requires a match of 50%. From fifty or from ten thousand to fifty thousand is a um, hundred percent match, and then the transformer, which is the last one, is up to a hundred thousand dollars, and that also requires a one hundred percent match. After some discussion with city staff, we talked about the signage just overall in the community, and you know I was here a couple weeks ago, and we actually put in an application for a tourism grant through the County of Sacramento with TOT funding. And we've yet to hear back. We're still waiting on um, an announcement on that grant program. And what we did with that was an application for a um, wayfinding signage program um, just for the program itself. This idea was that we incorporate Old Town but do a signage program for the entire community, really wanting to brand the community. Um, the city doesn't have a comprehensive wayfinding signage program. Just driving around town, what I've noticed is that there are different signs, different um, color schemes, it's very cluttered, um, and so these signs really are installed over time with multiple designs and little effectiveness. They don't really direct people to where we want them to be going. Um, existing signage contributes to visual clutter and to blight, and you, you, until you're really looking for it, you don't notice it, but when you start to you know, go out and really look for the signage that's around the community. It's scattered, it's small, it doesn't direct people effectively. And so we discussed um, possibly going after grant funding for an entire signage program for the entire city. And this is just a, an example of Lincoln Way and kind of what it looks like. Um, you have the historic Old Town and public parking sign, and then you have a police department sign right behind it, and then you have police on the back side as well above the stoplight with the cemetery sign. And so they're very small, hard to read. Um, we would like to remove all of those and put a comprehensive sign system in. Um, wayfinding signage um, is important to direct visitors who are coming from out of town, but also our residents. A lot of times we hear that people don't even know that there is an old town in Gulf. And so we want to make sure that we are able to brand ourselves effectively, but also provide effective signage. The um, Wayfinding Signage Project would support and promote a distinct identity for the city. It would enhance the ability and to easily navigate the city, um, again, for visitors and residents alike. 
and increases the success and market potential for retail, dining, entertainment, and economic growth in the city, which ultimately leads to sales tax increases and TOT increases. And also it provides a direct benefit to Old Town and um, the property and business owners in the Old Town area. This is some, um, an example of signage that was designed for the city of Novato. And again, you can incorporate lots of different um, sizes so that you can direct people off the freeway um, when they come off of some of the exits. Also smaller signage for um, some of the main arterials. You can include um, imagery for hospitals and for freeways so that you can remove a lot of the signs that we have existing all over town. So the staff recommendation is to submit a SHINE award in the amount of $50,000 um, and the city would match that with $50,000. So I would come back later on with an appropriation if we happen to receive that award. This would be in conjunction with the Chamber of Commerce. We are going to request um, that they participate as well and um, we were hoping that they had a successful strawberry festival so they would be able to do that. <laughs> The total project cost would be $100,000 and the funding would cover a comprehensive signage program um, for directional signage and the, the program itself would really take an inventory of what we have, what needs to be removed, um, what signage, um, the design, the branding, what the look is, but it also would cover the fabrication and installation of several signs to at least start the program. And if um, the award is um, provided to the city, what we would do is come back to council for an appropriation, also an implementation plan, um, working with the Chamber of Commerce and an MOU to sort of determine what that path looks like moving forward. And that concludes my presentation. Is there any questions? Council questions? Okay, thank you, Amy. Um, Do we have to, is, do I have to make a motion? Mm -hmm. Okay, could we uh, make a motion to coordinate with the Gulf District Chamber of Commerce for the submittal of a Smudge Shine <laughs> Award application? So moved. <coughs> so moved, yes, thank you. Second. <laughs> I'll second it. <laughs> okay. Uh, Cruz and Powers, call for the vote, please. Vice Mayor Cruz. Aye. Council Member Hewer. Aye. Council mm -hmm. Member Campion. Aye. Council Member Lanson. Aye. Mayor Powers. Aye. Okay. Now we're over to uh, Mr. Winkler presentation regarding water rate revenues. Well, as you may recall, we had a number of public hearings and council sessions on the uh, water rate restructuring that was done uh, about a year and a half ago. And then we had uh, about eight months of transition uh, with notifications on usage and estimated billings under the old flat rate and the new fully metered rate. And uh, at that time, uh, we had requests from council to bring back a report after a year uh, and uh, advise, you know, how we were doing on those revenues. And uh, one of the specific questions and concerns that was voiced was. Uh, you know, we're assuming a certain level of conservation and in restructuring this, we shifted the fixed versus certain amounts of variable uh, and, and selected one of an option to go with a 40% uh, variable, 60% fixed was the final result. And, uh, you know, the, the concern was, well, if the drought ends, which thank goodness it has at least for now, um, you know, that people might start using more water and that that could create uh, a potential for a windfall revenue uh, on the backs of our water rate users. So, so um, we're going to try to address kind of where we are and how we're doing relative to uh, projected revenues versus actual revenues. Uh, we not yet have a full year of fully metered data, but we do have uh, four billing periods of data. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mark Clarkson to kind of walk you through the presentation. And uh, we'd be happy to answer any questions at the conclusion. Mayor, Council. This will be boring because I don't have the bright, the brightness that we have. This is just going to be engineering. This is all. We're, we're going to change it. We're going to change it a little bit. We still have a few superheroes left, so we'll get through it. Steve just went over all my presentation, so I'll just go to the last one. Now, you know, there, there was we had several workshops, a couple hearings, went on for about uh, uh, four to five months. 
we had some direction that we needed uh, to take care of or, or needed from from uh, the council. We had some deficit that we saw that was going to happen, and we got our tea leaves together and our little crystal balls, and we took our policy direction that we've had uh, without um, unless Paige wants to sit here for after after school, we'll go through all of the hearing, but all of you, all of the rest of you were there at that time. Um, and we, uh, we came up with some numbers uh, after we crunched everything. And one of the things that I want to point out is the laser doesn't work that good. There it is, Ooh. hiding in there. When you look at what the prior rates were and you compare them to what we proposed, there was a, a big difference between them. So there was a lot of discussion of, are we going to get the estimates right? Are we going to use too much water because we've dropped the rate down? Are we going to impact customers because we've uh, increased the uh, base rate? So there was a lot of discussion, a lot of information that we provided and such. And as the council went ahead and, and adopted the, uh, the new rates, there was concern that we were going to hit our targets. and. Uh, uh, as much a, and maybe even overshoot our target um, that we had and, and with the efforts of uh, a lot of people and a lot of input um, and the customers themselves we um, we pretty hit our targets we don't have as much faith in our customers as our customers had in themselves and the reason why I say that is that when you look at at right here, we thought that the customers would use around uh, 13 CCF with about this rate that they would have. The customers are actually, in the last 10 months, are right around 12 uh, cubic uh, CCF, 100 cubic feet, um, which is really terrific. I mean, we had a, a kind of a wet year, kind of a wet year, understatement. But we also had several months from last summer that went into this. There was a lot of advertisement. There was a lot of disconcernation between, you know, the public and staff and trying to get this information out that the meters are coming. A lot of people were concerned about it. And so, you know, with all of the, the uh, publicity, with all of the effort, um, it, it showed that, that we were right in there on the target of what we estimated the customers uh, would be. This is residential right here. The bottom line, uh, the lower line, is the one that the existing meter customers were. The green line across were the flat rate customers. And that little blue line is what we estimated would happen um, with the new rates. And uh, we, were, we were pretty much right there on target with that. Um, lucky for us in the crystal ball. This one here is a little bit more difficult to understand. But we presented, we went out, because of the big base rates that we had, uh, on change on the meters and also the uh, variable rate, the commodity rate. We looked at several, about a dozen or so uh, uh, commercial establishments out there to see what it would affect them. So we initially had the first, we had this first uh, comparing rates and everything. And I thought I would just show you what happened in a 10 month prior period compared to the last 10 months. So when you look at this, it's a little more difficult to, to see it than to just explain it here. When you look at Cardinal gas, Glass, the previous 10 months versus this last 10 months, they used about 17% more water. They paid about 8% more on that same water. So there was a little increase on their usage, a little less increase on their amount that they paid. Now their base, their base went from about $150 over six hundred dollars a month, but their commodity dropped a little bit. So as when we when we showed you these the last time, we saw that there would be some people higher, some some customers lower. Um, when you get down into into one of these that are just straight across, even right at the bottom, when you look at a, a round table and stuff, they use twenty percent less water for the same between the periods. They paid about twenty percent less. But then you've got some others that are big uh, changers. The uh, tire company out there, they didn't use any more, but they paid, uh, and they paid 138% uh, uh, more. And that's just because of where their meter was and where it was, where it fell in the cost of service. But then you look at some others, when you look at the Galt, uh, the Galt uh, or the, the middle school here, they used a little bit more water. Uh, 
but they got a 20% reduction in rate during that. And it's just based on the amount of use, how the cost of service allocated all of the, the expenses to the different classes. And uh, so we go, how, do, how does that impact? You know, there's some people who gained, some people who lost a little bit. How did that impact us on our revenue generating? And that was the big thing. How much revenue are we getting in here? This table was given, uh, a slide was given back at, at the different hearings or, that we had. And when you look at, at this, this was the estimated operating expenses and debt service. And what we don't have here, it changes um, the difference between this uh, green line and, and in this space here is really capital projects that we have to have and other numbers. It's just something we couldn't just throw in, throw in there. And we didn't do it back at that time either. We just showed you this by itself, that this is our anticipated revenue that we're going to have, um, proposed uh, revenue with the new rates. And when you look at the uh, last year's, this year's, and, and next year's estimate, we're going to be right along that green line. We're just a little bit higher than that right now. This is an actual number. We're at 3.6 million versus 3.4, uh, the estimated. We're uh, just around, again, 3.6 million. We estimate a little over 3.4. And this next year that we're proposing, in, or, or that we're estimating in fiscal year 18, it'll be actually just under 3.6. So we're right in there, but you, you still see by no adjustments at all um, where our revenue is, it's going to go in the negative in a couple of years. And that's just, that's just what happened. We, we, took this rev, we took this cost of service study and we were given direction just to be revenue neutral. And that's what it shows here, that we're actually being revenue neutral. We're not quite, we're, we're about 6% off of what our estimates were. But a lot of that had to do with another 300 plus customers that we didn't expect to have. You know, we kept our estimates a little low, conservative. Um, there was um, a little bit more water use in some areas, in some categories, and a little bit less in others. Um, but we're, we're pretty much right there on target on what our revenues are. So with that, we've had enough numbers tonight. But um, open for questions. On the, on the, uh, the projections, and I understand that you're looking at the total operating budget. Uh, which includes a whole bunch of other revenue sources aside from just the um, fee rate that the customer pays monthly because there's other revenues in there. But in, what I was interested in, and I, I, I kind of see it but I don't really, is looking at a comparison of where we were on the flat rate with the proposed deficit of 325000 This was back in 15, I believe. And then once we uh, converted over to the metered rates, what the actuals are, and, and you do have some of the actual information here, but then th I, I can't tell on this, is, is the proposed 6040 what you were estimating at the time that the 6040 was adopted? Because I, I can't tell. No, this, this estimate right here, the green line here, was the 6040. This is what was adopted. Okay, but again, this is on your total operating budget. I, I'm not. I, I was just looking at your what the what the rates for the the customer rate revenue was. I think that's what I was more interested in, um, rather than because I took it as the three hundred twenty-five thousand dollars that the proposed deficit was based just on the rate structure. That's how it appeared to be presented, at least in fifteen. The, the rate structure at the $325,000 deficit that we would have had annually, right. that's if we adopted, if we just kept the meter rates that we had at that time. So that, okay, so that was that, just... That's where everybody would have went down here and, and the commercial customers, nothing would have changed. We would have just accepted those rates. So the existing meter, or is that, I'm confused, is that the existing meter... That where we had the 900 and all the commercial meters, or is that existing meters today? Okay, we had we had a, a metered rate for existing customers, right? At, at residential, 900 commercial and residential, right. right in there. This is a residential one. This is what the rates were for that 
the old rate. That's right. the old rate. So you're saying prior to what the council adopted. So, so when we look at this one right here, this is what the rates were. If we kept those rates, if we just extended those rates out to all of our 7,000 customers, we would have had a $325,000 a year deficit. Okay, I, what I'm trying to make heads or tails of is this graph because I can't tell it says existing flat, existing metered. Now, is that metered in 15? Okay. That's what I don't, I, I don't, okay. I don't follow the, that. I, I'm, this, this whole graph was provided back before the, uh, was provided during the hearings and during the workshops. I only added this part down here. So this is what you saw at the hearing. This is what we said the existing rates were. This, the blue line is what we said what the new rates would be, what the current rates are. Okay, that's what, this is what we projected. This is the graph right here that we projected. Okay. And what I added down here, just this little couple of written things down here, is that we're at, with the new rates, with 10 months into the new rates, we're at about 12 a CCF. We estimated that, that customers okay. would be around 13. Okay. okay. So th this is what was provided as an estimate before you adopted the rate structure. Is this the graph that is a little confusing as far as is it was before or is it current? Well, it's, it's news to me that none of this is actual. I was of the assumption trying to figure out what was actual. All right, so this is not a revenue graph. This is a, a rate graph under the old existing rates okay. structure for a flat rate residential. This does not look at the commercial. Right, well, I, and I tried what to, we propose the rate. I tried to interpret that as what we have today based on this 10 months of data. There's nowhere in the report that it differentiates between this and. That was the confusing part. So what okay, I, the 10 months of data right here, we have a 12 CCF for the customers for residential. Okay. The, this one right here shows that the green line, take the two X's out and take my comments out down here and this is what was presented before the rates were adopted. Now after the rates were adopted and impl implemented, whoa, I just messed it up. Uh, I just hit the block button one more time. The black button. Uh, sorry. So what we, what you're seeing there, the two X's are actual, or well, one's actual and one's about a month away from being an actual, or a couple of weeks now. And but this this graph you saw, again, that was our estimate. The whole thing was our estimate, except what I just wrote down here and added these two X's. And that is what our actuals are. But that's again on the whole. Uh, that's on the operating budget. I, that's not what. Well, this is this right here. This line is what our new, um, the uh, uh, proposed revenue stream would be. Proposed. What was proposed? Back here. My my uh, thumb is just too fat here. <laughs> this this is what was proposed. This green line right here. And we found. I've got one, one point that's an actual where that green line is, and then we've got kind of a, a prime because we're about a month away from that one, a couple of weeks away from having that actual number. Kurt, is your concern? I'm trying to understand. Well, what I was what I was looking at when I went through the budget and I looked in the revenue side of the budget for water, um, what you have are, uh, and that may be the line for the operating budget. I don't disagree with you, but what I was looking at is just that which was a, uh, a result of the new rate structure. And that shows in the budget that we are slightly above by about $40,000 based on the projections just on, based on the rate structure. So my, my point is, I'm, what I'm trying to point out is that we've got, we, we, we've conserved, you know, 30%, we're 30% lower than historic water usage. So my point is, is trying to figure out is the 60-40 the actu actually the correct um, methodology because if, if we go back to pre-drought conditions, uh, consumption will go up 
Um, and you know, theoretically, you'll have some, you'll have an increment of, of, of revenue increase based on that. It'll be marginal because your consumption side is less than your, than your fixed. So what I was trying to trying to figure out is, we had the three hundred twenty-five thousand dollars, which I I thought was based just on the rate structure, not the operating budget. Then we had um, uh, the sixty forty based on actuals over the 10 month period to show what consumption was and what revenues would be, and then what was presented to us, which you showed us, showed us tonight, on what your projected consumptions were, as well as revenue. That's what I was asking six, eight months ago. Well, was it based on operating budget? Come, you didn't talk to them before this, so we could have gotten the answers and figured it out. Didn't know it was coming and oh, okay. was so. Uh, I would have been more than happy to. Well, th that would be, you know, w what I did, that could be, you know, I'll, I'll put that on I'll myself. Is I went I will, to the notes. How about if I give you a call and then maybe we can talk about that and, and uh, get into it? Because I don't, I, I, what you brought, I understand, but it, I don't, it wasn't what I asked, you know, a number of months ago. Yeah, I, I just went to the minutes. I just took the minutes and I went from there. So we'd be happy to bring more data if you, okay. if you could help us. Be clear on exactly what should more, and we'd certainly make that available to the entire council. Because we're all a little confused right now. Uh, so, Mark, just what, so, <laughs> so what it would appear, from what I understand, is that our the 60/40 split is raising enough revenue to cover our operating expenses, probably through through 2020. Right. Because even though we drop down, we are we have an excess right now that will cover the deficit in 2020 so we actually look like unless consumption goes way up and throws our numbers all off it does appear at this point that the 60 40 split is working and the revenue and the rates are and, that, and that's as close as we can come it's like we're in the middle of a race right now yeah. and we're trying to predict the, the winner at the end of the first quarter it's really tough because it takes about about three years before the customers get into a, a regular habit after a rate restructuring like what we did here. And so we're kind of in the middle. It looks, it looks like we're going to be able to keep our revenue. It didn't, you know, go downhill, you know, you know, not being able to recover it. And it didn't skyrocket either. But we're yeah. still in the middle of this. Yeah, my concern a year ago was, you know, we were kind of just throwing the dart at the board, going by what the consultant was projecting and, and everything else. So I'm, I'm glad to see that it appears to be at this point that the split is covering the co operating costs and covering the debt service. Right. We're in the right ballpark. Yeah, that we're in the ballpark. Uh, we're, we're, we're not overcharging. We're yeah. not undercharging. We don't have customers subsidizing other customers anymore, which was what we had, had going on for many years. So, um, so that's and that's we will be point. looking at this annually. Uh, we cannot charge more than our cost of providing service when we include the capital uh, budgets and reserves as well. Um, we had a conservative growth estimate. We didn't want to over assume an aggressive growth number because then if the economy uh, cooled off, now we're counting on future revenues that won't exist. So we use a very low growth rate. Well, we're in a pretty good trend right now and we've uh, actually uh, growth rate has doubled over what the the long-term assumption was so we'd see a little bit of extra revenue from 300 supplemental accounts and uh, uh, people are still even though uh, the drought has officially ended um, even into we just got the uh, May numbers uh, earlier this week and they're still at 29 percent mm -hmm. conservation over two years ago uh, two-year average and so as long as that behavior continues we're in the right ballpark now if People start using a lot of water, then it starts to, we assumed uh, in the rate study, was it 15% long-term water conservation? And right now they're, Correct. Doing, yeah. they're doing closer to 30. So we'll see if that behavior sticks. And it would appear that the average customer that was flat rate before who went to meters is pretty much paying the same amount. They're paying right. about 75 cents. Yeah. Well, that, and that's what we were aiming for. Yeah, the, the the I think the 60/40, particularly given the drought years, made a made sense. Not knowing that, but I mean, you you had a higher fixed rate, and your variable was on your consumptions. Well, it's it's working with a 10-month 
snapshot of right. fully transitioned metered rates, and and uh, we obviously annually look at uh, an, an index increase. And if we get to the point where we're above the mark, then we would recommend that we don't take the index. Okay. Very good. Well, Mark, just go to the comparing previous rates with new rates slide, please. Just pretty good. Comparing previous rates with new rates. The cardinal glass. Old rates. <laughs> cardinal glass and the cardinal. This one. I understand that. So if you look at Horizon, yeah. they go 11 percent and then plus 79. So are they being charged 79 percent more than they're using, or are they being charged 79 percent under? No. What this is, what this is showing that Horizon used 11 percent more water. Over this this last peri this period versus another 10 month period that we compared, they used 11 percent more water, and they were charged 79 percent more for that water. Okay. That's well, as soon as this gets out, you're going to have some fun people coming back to talk to you. <laughs> yeah, it, you know, you know, we looked at this the same customer, and we said this is what was going to happen with your existing. And what's going to happen with the new rates? And you had some a little higher, right. you had some a little lower, and that's what you see here. There's some higher, some gainers, and not so gaining. You know, typically, uh, the way the rate structure works at the 60/40 is the large users will actually save money um, because while the base fees went up substantially for those larger meters. If you're using a lot of water, like the schools and things with a lot of irrigation, mm -hmm. um, you quickly outstrip that with the reduced uh, water usage rate. Right. Uh, small users, um, we've got a lot of stranded assets out there, and they're not using much water, but we still have to have the capacity for them to use the water. Uh, under this larger base amount, tended to be the, the class of customers uh, that you know are paying more for the water. Uh, Mainly because they're using less, and I would guess if you looked at the usage on Horizon, you know they're they're a fairly small user, probably don't have a lot of irrigated uh, uh, landscape, and so they they're still in that that base rate increase on their meter size. They probably have a two inch meter would be a guess yeah. on a church, and they're paying a lot more for that two inch meter monthly, uh, yeah. but they're not necessarily using a lot of water. You know, one thing I do want to keep uh, uh, keep focus is that this was a cost of service study. It was an equity study, and it was done under Prop 218 requirements, and so no adjustments were made to make more people pay and less people, you know, other people pay. It was straight across the board, and that's what made it. Actually, when you look at the Prop 218 and the requirements there, it made it really easy for us to come into compliance because nobody was pressuring us to do that to make an inequity there. It was equity across the board. So, and some people were impacted in a positive way and some people are not so positive based on that equity. And there was much discussion over the 60-40 split and whoever voted for when we voted for that, we did pretty good to that way too. I think we're there. Yeah, I, I mean, good. again, we're still in the that middle of the big, game. That was a big thing for a couple of meetings too, so <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Anybody does, else? does the council want us to bring this back? With the additional information, I'll, I'll talk with staff. Well, Nothing. talk with staff and then bring it back. Let's not have a big, you know. Let's let's have a concise report. Talk back if you don't mind. Sure. The, bring it bring it back to the right. Yeah, after Kurt. Absolutely. Does this sure. thing? Okay. Now we're to the city clerk's report. Um, <coughs> Donna. Yes, it's the community benefit funding grant. The recommendation is to review the funding request applications and make funding determinations. As you are aware, the budget contains $10,000 for allocating to a Galt nonprofit organization in the form of a community benefit funding grant. Um, as in past years, we advertised in two local newspapers. Uh, we placed the application on the city's website and on social media and received two applications which are attached to the agenda report, the first one's from the Galt Area Historical Society for the McFarland Ranch Barn Project, and they're asking for $10,000. And the Galt Adventist Christian School, K-8, Electric Sign Project, they are also asking for $10,000. Included in the agenda packet is the policy and also a little bit of history of who um, has received the past award grant. Do you have any questions? 
I felt kind of bad that only two people after we tried to get this out here and everything, and now we've got just two people, uh, upon, uh, two organizations, I'm sorry, applying yeah. for it. I do see that the Historical Society is here, but I do not see Seventh-day Adventists. Mm -mm. Is there anyone here from the Seventh-day Adventists? No? Okay, a council, and uh, do you want to hear from the, what's your pleasure here? Would you like to hear from the Historical Society, or is it written good enough, or? You got I just have thoughts? a lot of quick question, Janice, if you don't mind coming up. You know, it's funny because right here we're all freezing. freezing. We're it? all freezing and she's really hot. It's, it's warm here. Warm. So, yeah. It's warm here. Kind of yeah. Hot. It's hot. It's very cold. Yeah. Where we are. Janice, last year you were unable to spend the funds that we gave you, mm -hmm. and so we had to carry them over to this year. Do you anticipate spending this $10,000 within this calendar oh, year if awarded? Oh, definitely. We've already hired an engineer. Mike Smith is on board. He's already drawn the preliminary, the first preliminary plans for the um, event center, learning center, that will look like a barn, a public center. We're actually meeting with him next week. He's drawn one plan, and we've made our suggestions and what we wanted. And uh, so we're meeting with him next week again for the second review, and you know we add things as we go along and until we get it where we want it, and then eventually the park and rec for the county has to approve before we start building. But no, definitely, we're we're ready to go, yeah, with it. So, thank you, thank you, welcome. Mark, did you? No, oh, okay. I'm, sorry. I'm saving my voice. Yeah. I I, I uh, you know I've been an advocate of the historical society for years. Um, I think this barn project. Uh, um, will provide uh, a tremendous venue for the Galt area, educational purposes. Um, uh, they have school children out there now uh, from not only Galt schools but the surrounding uh, communities. Um, I know the Historical Society um, builds on itself in terms of fundraising. They do a number of events to offset the cost for this number of projects. And, um, I would uh, make a recommendation to uh, fund them in total, uh, the, the entire team. Can I, can I say a couple of things, that, the points that I wanted to bring out? Um, the last year, because uh, we're obviously all volunteers, and uh, last year we did over 15,000 hours of volunteer time for our projects and fundraisers. And I know the, uh, there's a formula that, that you use for when you're figuring grants and for in-kind grants and stuff. And, so I think in the state of California, it's figured something like $28 an hour, which would equate to over $400,000 of, of uh, volunteer time that our workers have done. And uh, we've raised ourselves uh, over $60,000 uh, just in our fundraisers. I just I bring that up because we just we don't expect things just to fall out of the sky. We go you know we, we go looking for money, but our, our bylaws. Uh, require that any of the fundraising we use goes for the preservation and um, restoration of Galt's history, Galt area, and, and I, I always like to stress that because we're not, we just aren't the city of Galt, it's the whole area. Anything that feeds into Galt High District, um, we have uh, Clay Station, Harold, Thornton, Galt, uh, Arno, Hicksville, Liberty, Elliott. Uh, we actually own the two cemeteries in Liberty and, and Elliott that we maintain. So we have the whole area that we're restoring the history from. Our fundraising goes for that and our, our bills for the Ray House Museum and for the McFarland just to run the, run the two of them. So we rely on grants and donations uh, to build new projects and that's why we're here asking for the, the 10000 Um This is probably going to, as I told you last time, it's going to be the largest project that we've ever done. And in your packet it says, uh, 800,000. I, I think we're looking more than that at this point. And we've got a lot of money raised. We did have an anonymous donor who uh, uh, donated uh, 435,000 towards this project. So um, we're well on our way and um, with other grants to the county and, and as, as you have given us too. So I, um, we want, when we start this, we want to finish it. I mean, we, we don't want it just sitting out there half done. I mean, we're looking to, to do the whole project when we start. So. And it's not just how it benefits the children of our community, but also economics. And, and when we look economics. at economic development and what it does for um, 
the renting of weddings and the renting of events and what that does for our hotels and our restaurants and exactly. it, it benefits our us economically. Exactly. And we're always looking for ways to um, do things out of the McFarland to, to benefit the community. We're, we're right now, uh, I know it's a couple years off, 2019 for the Lincoln Highway celebration when we they do the reenactment when Eisenhower crossed the country. We're actually working right now with that group trying to get them to perhaps to stay here at the McFarland camp out with the old uh, uh, equipment, the jeeps and, and things, and so perhaps we can make it a community event. So we're kind of working on, we always get working on some kind of angles. <laughs> and so, so anyway, but I, I do appreciate your consideration and for the 10,000. So. Did you make a motion, Kurt? Yes, I did. Well, I'll second that. Okay, well, I know the um, Historical Society got, a, got a, almost all of the grant last year. I would really like to see some go to Seventh-day Adventist, not fund their whole sign. Um, they do a lot of community events with their kids singing at the Veterans Day and the memorial service. Um, and it would help to make that area look nice with a nice sign. So I'd, I'd like to see a little bit go towards them. Um, how, many kids, how many people go to that, children go to that school, do you know? How big the school is? I have no idea. I believe maybe 50, 50 kids. Um, I know it's not a lot. I, I'm just inclined to agree now that we have to start looking out for something that really benefits the whole of um, the city and uh, the impact that it has on a lot of people. So I, I'm inclined to go with Kurt and give it all to the historical society. That's that's where I'm at. Anybody else want to add their two cents before we have a motion? Mark. We have a motion and a second. I didn't, I didn't hear the second. I yeah. seconded it. Okay. Sorry. I, I too, a little, I'm a little disappointed that we only have two people in there. And I read through that, and to be honest with you, the sign's a nice idea, but it's in the wrong location. And I, I think they could do better with other monies okay. to, to promote their, their, uh, their school. So I think the money would be better spent with the Historical Society. Fair enough. Okay, everybody. Okay, call for the vote, please. Vice Mayor Cruz? Aye. Councilmember Hewer? Aye. Councilmember Campion? Aye. Councilmember Lampson? Aye. Mayor Powers? Aye. Oh, wait. Sorry. That was go. It's the night. No. <laughs> Sometimes you just have one of those days when it's been a while. Okay, now we're back to comments by staff. Emily, well, you want to. You all talked out, okay, Chris? Stephen. Okay, Mark already left for us. Armando. I do. This is the last council meeting before our IDC event. Uh, if you have any money left over, I'd be glad to take any sponsorship money from you. Um, <laughs> we're still looking for last minute sponsors. If you guys have know anybody that'd like to help with the with the event, um, so we have the parade. We have the 5K. We have the a new band, the Michael Beck Band, out at Veterans Field, and then fireworks at 9.30. I know I've heard from three of you about the parade. If you can, the other two could get back to me on if uh, you'll be uh, participating, that'd be great, just so we can get things ready and prepared for you. So if anybody has any questions about it, I'd to answer them. So I missed a great opportunity when I was presented this check um, by Bonnie. Um, I came in third, not last. Um, Rich Lozano was here, and what he came in second. And at the event itself, uh, he and his fellow uh, fire uh, fighter, uh, I think it was Wolfgang Puck in disguise, but that's just my opinion. Uh, the prize money went 500, 300, and 200 for the different placements. And at the event itself, Rich, they were both playing for the same organization, and that's to help. Uh, uh, when a firefighter goes down and help the families, uh, Rich gave his winnings to uh, End of Watch so that both organizations got $500. And so while I was sitting here, I actually opened up the check, and this check taxes for $500, not $200 that uh, that I earned. So that was really nice of Rich, and he's not here to, to share that. So um, I've already thanked him myself personally. I'm sure End of Watch will too, but uh, I wanted to do that publicly. And then on Friday where is the Special Olympics torch run. Um, we will at 6 a.m. be lighting the uh, torch um, at uh, East Lawn 
and we will be at the Eternal Flame platform, which faces Officer Kevin Tom's grave site. We will be lighting it and having a small ceremony there. We will move the torch um, to Elk Grove, where the run will begin. Uh, I'll pass the torch off to uh, Chief Noblet, then it will go to Sacramento Police Department, and uh, where we go to the state capitol, so that's our really our big significance uh, with the Special Olympics that it ends up going to the capitol to uh, actually kick off the ceremony for the state of California. Uh, so that's at 10 o'clock, and there will be a presentation there. Uh, so uh, it's a big day on Friday. And congratulations. Yeah. On my uh, third place win, not last no, place. On your election. Second of the losers. Your vice president, your vice, your... Oh, yes, thank you. Chiefs Association. Uh, the Central Sierra Chiefs Association, which is um, an organization that's along the Sierras that goes from the Oregon border down to Turlock, uh, east to the to the uh, Nevada border, and then cuts off about Yolo County, and then it kind of skirts around and goes all the way up to the, the northwest coast. Uh, so all the police agencies in the middle of that, and on uh, the meeting last Friday, I was actually nominated as vice president for that organization, so that's a big deal. I'm, I'm really proud. and because uh, you're actually voted in by your peers. So. Well, congratulations. Congrats. Thanks. Jean, I'm sorry, were you finished? <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't. Oh, I am finished. Thanks. Okay. Jean. Okay. I have nothing to add. Okay. Okay, nothing from Kurt. Well, I was treated to a lovely meeting along with Cora to, uh, with the Parks and Rec Department and thought I knew a lot about Parks and Rec, but I was actually learned a few more things. Thank you so much, Armando, for your hospitality. We were treated to some scrumptious tacos and a churro. That was pretty good. And then the, the same week, I met with the police department, and they did, and Cora went with me, and they did try to outdo with snacks. <laughs> Donuts. <laughs> that was the first place. Lemonade and Skittles. Lemonade and Skittles and a bunch of little chips. They did provide a PowerPoint, like Parks and Rec, but I didn't get a binder, so you win. You win. Okay. <laughs> ah um, I also attended the tractor pull, which was an FFA fundraiser, <laughs> and with the the heat, a lot of people didn't didn't come out. It was 100 and, yeah. 108, and the new metal bleachers were a little warm. Um, they were just a little, just a little warm. And be thinking of the future of the beautification committee. They want to start focusing on Christmas decorations, so council will be thinking on how we can come up with some great ideas on that. So, because we'll blink our eyes and that'll be great. I know. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I'll be attending the League of California Cities conference next week, um, Wednesday to Friday, I think. And so, I also would like to, um, Armando. So my um, discretionary um, dollars for 2017-2018, um, I would like to give back to the city. Now, I don't spend that money, but I would like it to go to um, the, I know you really, the, the Independence Day celebration. So if that money, it can come back, but I don't <laughs> spend that money on any personal donations, but I would like to see it go because I know you've re worked really hard on trying to find funding. So. Thank you. Mark. You did get a first place though in the donate, donating contest, so that's a plus. <laughs> I timed it, and it was a whole donut, and I think it took less than two seconds. Maybe. And it was less without water. Anybody got a picture of that? that it? No, it's just All one right. more thing. I do have a video. I, I do okay. have a, 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 a more realistic thing to go with here. Um, <laughs> Last council meeting, we had a, a citizen come up and talk to us about flagpoles and how it was inappropriate and so forth, that they should have, not have be limited to only two poles. And doing a little research, it's found that the surrounding cities, both in San Joaquin County and in uh, Sacramento County, all only allow one flagpole. Where this is gotten out of hand as far as giving our, our city a black eye is when we get state elected officials involved when they shouldn't be. Right. This is a local local uh, issue that should be handled by local elected officials. We were never given that chance. And to be honest with you, I don't think we should have dealt with it and we should not deal with it because this is a family quarrel and this city represents an entire community. 
not two families. That's my way of looking at it. Anybody else wants to give me a call, give me a call, but I can tell you straight up, this community is very patriotic, and there's a reason why it's called a great American little town. That's all I got. You're totally correct on that one. Well, Lori, you kind of rained on my parade because I'm going to give you my $1,000 too, Armando, because I mean, I'm going to pat myself on the back with this because uh, way back when, when we did uh, take it over back to the city, it was my idea and council member uh, mm -hmm. Singleton's. And then you immediately kicked us off the committee. But hey, <laughs> not only a crush, but I'm going to give you my $1,000 too because I do think it's a great community event and it is something that is used for everyone in the town. So high five, Lori. Okay. Okay, with that, I close the meeting. Thank <laughs> you.